Homily 1, Part 1 of Coptic Homilies in the Dialect of Upper Egypt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Coptic Homilies in the Dialect of Upper Egypt by E. A. Wallace Budge. The discourse which Apajon, the Archbishop of Constantinople, pronounced concerning repentance and continence. If the blessed man Paul, the apostle of the Gentiles, who became the doctor of the church, who fought in pain and anguish to make himself to be like unto the incorporeal powers in his daily life, who completed his course and kept the faith, who kept his light shining in fastings and in hunger and in thirst and amid dangers, who traveled with patient endurance the road from Jerusalem to Illyricum, preaching the gospel, this angel who belonged to the earth, this man who belonged to the heavens, who possessed Christ, who spake in him, the habitation of the Holy Spirit, who was caught up to the third heaven and heard the words of mystery, who was carried away into paradise, who was, by reason of his love and zeal, well nigh the equal of Christ, who bore the care of the churches, the orator of piety, the sponsor of those who believe on Christ, the herald and teacher of the Gentiles, who hath taught unto us the way whereby to enter into heaven. If this man, I say, said, I subdue my body, and make it to be a servant, lest, having preached unto others, I myself shall become a castaway. And moreover, if this holy man, who possessed in his own person so great a multitude of spiritual excellences, and who spake out boldly, saying, I know not how to do anything of myself, was afraid and spake in this manner, What shall we ourselves do, who are miserable creatures, and who are wholly unable to cultivate successfully one spiritual excellence? Is it not then seemly for us to keep watch and pray, at all times, and to make petitions to God, neither for gold, nor silver, nor for any of the riches of this world, but only for the riches which are in the heavens, and to have gladness in God? Now there are certain folk who rejoice in their wealth, and some rejoice in wine drinkings in taverns, and in eating at feasts, while others rejoice in beauty and glory of this world. As for the virgin, let him rejoice in God. Let him seek after the honor which cometh from his hands, saying, My justification is before thee. There is nothing which is so poverty-stricken or so contemptible as the soul which is filled with passion. For this reason it is seemly for us to take strict care of our souls at all times. And we must say, even as did the holy man David, God giveth strength to my beauty, so that when the bridegroom looketh upon the beauty of the soul, he shall say, Thou art wholly beautiful, my love, and there is no blemish in thee. But even if it be that thy spiritual excellence flourisheth, take good care that thy heart be not over-exalted, because of thy beauty, lest God turn his face away from thee, because of thine exaltation of heart. For who is there who could make himself worthy of the things which Christ endured, then patiently on thy behalf? He humbled himself for thee, and he gave his holy blood to be the price for thee. He who gave food unto all flesh, fasted in the flesh for thy sake. He who created the sweetness in the honey, tasted that which was bitter gall for thy sake. He who ornamented the heavens with the companies of the stars wore a crown of thorns for thy sake, and he became obedient even unto death, the death of the cross. Is it not then seemly for us to show ourselves glad because of these things? Nay, we must make ourselves to lament, and we must weep. Let us hearken unto that which the book saith, be sorrowful in heart upon your beds because of the things which ye have said in your hearts, so that we may have in remembrance in the night season the things which we have done during the day, and that we may heave sighs concerning them. This is what Ahab did when he was in sorrow. He fasted and he girded sackcloth about his body. And what did God say concerning him? I will not bring the evils upon him in his days. It was for this reason that the Savior proclaimed to be blessed those who weep, not those who weep for the dead or the loss of property, but those who weep for their sins. 
thou thyself shalt say even as did david night after night i wash my bed and i soak my cushions with my tears and again he saith mine eyes pour out streams of water because men keep not thy law wash thou away the defilement by means of tears smite upon thy breast and take to thyself the remembrance of the sins which thou hast committed if thou hast been snared at any time through thine eye if thou hast opened thy window at any time wickedly thou hast done injury to thy soul through thine eye the eyes which look with wicked intent heal thou now with tears and shut thou thy window that thou mayest not see again the things of vanity for otherwise thou wilt fall into an evil habit now habit is wont to draw him that clingeth thereto into great sins when thou hast arrayed thyself in splendid apparel take good heed unto thyself not to sit down in any dirty place lest it become spotted if thou shalt hold to be a light matter in the first stain and the second and the third at length thy whole garment shall become dirty thou shalt not be careless and sit down in any polluted place whatsoever what are we to do then thou hast need of fervent prayer lest thou strike a stone with thy feet and thou shalt pray fervently that the angel of god shall compass thee round about and shall deliver thee and thou thyself shalt be strong and shalt say the angel who delivered me out of all evil and thou shalt pray fervently that the angel may cry out unto thee from heaven even as he cried to abraham for the angels love those who love their own god he i e the book saith moreover take a psalm set ye forth a tabret a sweet psaltery and harp thou art to take one thing and three are demanded from thee for we are composed of three things even as the apostle paul spake he will keep safe him that is in the spirit and he will make healthy your souls and your bodies now the psaltery is the spirit the harp is the soul the tabret is the dead skin which covereth it therefore put thou to death the flesh and thus shalt thou make thyself strong to ascribe blessings to god with the tabret and dance for it is god himself who hath filled thee with flesh observe therefore lest he should say unto thee what profit is there in my blood what kind of recompense canst thou possibly make to him which shall be adequate for all the suffering which he endured on thy behalf be thou a tree which beareth fruit and thus shalt thou cause the blessing of god to be upon thee bring forth fruit according to thy strength if thou art not able to bring forth an hundredfold which is the number of perfection then bring forth sixtyfold which is the half thereof and if this be difficult for thee then bring forth thirtyfold which is one third thereof only thou must labor according to thy strength for if thou art without fruit they will cut thee down and cast thee into the burning if thou canst not be a vessel of gold or silver do not become a log of wood or straw or grass which are merely fuel for the burning thou shalt not perform the works which god hateth for they shall take their stand before thee on the day of judgment like solid images and finally thou wilt have to begin to confess them in that place without witnesses and without an advocate and without proofs and thou wilt have to look upon all the deeds which thou hast committed and upon all the words which thou hast uttered unwillingly and they shall stand up like statues before thine eyes weep before the time so that thou mayest not hear in that place the words this is not the time for repentance for no repentance is possible in this place so long then as we have the time let us do work for if the time slip through our hands it is unlikely that we will find another opportunity moreover for this reason the blessed paul taught us saying so long as we have the time let us do the things which are good and again he saith behold now is the time which is accepted let us then weep over the deeds which we have committed unrighteously and let us make tears to flow down our cheeks in streams and let us beat our breasts in sorrow so that we may do away with the weeping and the gnashing of the teeth 
in that place whereto we must depart. Moreover, let us weep even as did David, in order that we may be proclaimed blessed. He did not shed a few tears only as men do when they weep, but he flooded his bed with his tears, and he passed the whole night in vigil. One night only he sinned, yet he wept night after night, and never ceased from crying, and he freely acknowledged his sins in the following words. And in this manner, saying, Forgive me these offenses, thou didst give me mine eyes, that I might see thy light with them, but I have seen wickedly with them. Since therefore I have gone astray through mine eyes, for this reason do away my sins through my tears. Let us come forth from our habits which are evil, and remove ourselves into the city which is in the heavens. Let us subdue our body, let us make it to be a servant, lest peradventure we make our souls to be the servant of the devil. Let the careful consideration of the words of God reduce to peace the delights of the senses which are ingrained in our hearts, and which resemble those that are found in wild animals. And let us bear at all times the death of our Lord Jesus Christ in our bodies. And let us keep in remembrance that which he spake, saying, Be prudent, be ye vigilant. The man that slumbereth shall not receive the crown of victory, and the man that is careless and idle shall not receive the prize. But the man who hath borne innumerable buffetings and wounds is he who shall receive honor from the master of the contest. Now the enemy is in the habit of taking to flight before him that is prudent, but he plundereth him that slumbereth. Therefore thou must know that thou hast about thee three enemies which are evil. Give therefore no sleep to thine eyes, nor slumber to thine eyelids, that thou mayest escape like a roe from the snare of the hunter, and like a bird from the net of the fowler. Let us flee at all times from the cares of this world, and from the burdens thereof. If we would make ourselves to be free from this world, we must not make to ourselves care for the things of the world, for very many have been snared by the guile thereof. For the book saith, He who is our adversary, the devil, goeth about roaring, like the lions, seeking after prey, not however prey in the literal sense of the word, but to devour that which is in the soul. Flee from the knavery of the crafty one, and thou shalt say, Through thee shall I be delivered from a company of thieves, and through my God I shall leap over a wall. Seek not to excuse thyself from suffering, lest, by so doing, thou shalt excuse thyself from the crown also. The merchant loseth not courage, but he endureth even the waves of the sea, and he findeth possessions. He who contendeth is wont to fight in pain and suffering even unto wounds, for his heart looketh for the crown of victory. The husbandman doth not find ears of corn in his tillage, unless he hath first of all sown the seed thereof by his own toil. This is what is to be expected from the kingdom which is in the heavens. Men must account tribulations as nothing whatsoever, and they must fortify their hearts by means of the hope of the good things which shall come. Let us therefore devote our whole attention to watching at all times, so that when our bridegroom shall return and look in the bride chamber, we may hear his voice, and may rise up, and may meet him being prepared to receive him. For he said, Let your loins be girt up, let your lamps be filled and lighted, and do ye even as do those men who are expecting to see their Lord. Now behold, the Savior proclaimed, Bless the man who was sober, saying, Blessed is that servant, whose master on coming shall find him keeping watch. And as he proclaimed, Blessed those who kept watch, so also did he regard him that was careless as a bad servant. For he spake, saying, That wicked servant shall say in his heart, My master tarrieth. And he shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and to drink and to become drunken. And the master of that wicked servant shall come on a day which he knoweth not, and in an hour wherein he expecteth him not. And he shall cut him asunder, and shall set his portion with the unbelieving ones. If they shall cut asunder him that saith, My master tarrieth, what shall they do unto him that doth not expect to see him at all? Therefore, O my beloved, 
what is meet for us to do in this, we must act in such a way that we may find ourselves prepared at any hour. We must sail a straightforward course, and always in the same direction, for it is unlikely that we shall be able to return back again and cultivate successfully that concerning which we have been careless. Let us therefore be prepared at any hour, so that we may say with boldness, Lord, my heart is ready, my heart is ready. In this life we are in a mighty war. The workers of evil, who are the demons, stretch their bows. Then one of them shooteth an arrow into our ears, so that we may listen to slanderous chatterings with pleasure. And another shooteth an arrow into our eyes, so that we may turn our gaze in a wrongful manner towards the things which are unseemly. And another shooteth an arrow into our tongue, so as to make us to revile scornfully our brother. And another shooteth an arrow into our belly, which exciteth in us the appetite of gluttony. And another shooteth an arrow into our hands, which leadeth us on to deeds of rapine, and greed of the most excessive character. And another shooteth an arrow into our feet, which moveth us to walk into wickedness. Because of all these things the blessed man Paul armed us with weapons, for he wrote, saying, Take unto you the whole armor of God, and the helmet of the Spirit. With these ye shall be able to quench every fiery dart of the evil one. Let us hearken unto the voice of the prophet, which saith, He hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and also that which God seeketh after at thy hands, to make thyself to perform judgment and righteousness. And thou shalt love mercy, and to prepare to follow closely after the Lord thy God. Therefore let us forget the things which are behind, and reach forth unto those things which are before. Let us delight ourselves in the Lord, and let us feed upon his words. Let us not waste our opportunities in emptiness, but as we have a good Lord, let us perform service to him in truth. Consider the great love for man which he showeth in respect of us. Sometimes he appealeth to us, sometimes he threaten us with punishments, and sometimes he teacheth us obedience, and he bestoweth rewards upon those who hearken unto him. Therefore we must gird up the loins of our heart in truth. Let us perform the service of the good God, our Savior. Let us keep in remembrance all the things which he suffered for our sakes. He was made after the manner of a man for our sakes. He was suckled at the breast like a man. He made himself to be a child in age. He received baptism for our sakes. He suffered hunger. He slept. He slumbered for our sakes. He mourned. They made him the object of plots, of treachery. They scourged him. They treated him contumely. And finally they delivered him over to death for our sakes. Let us then think at all times on all these things which he suffered patiently for the sake of our sins. And that the book saith, Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin, but ye shall fight against sin. That is to say, although we are not now asked to give our blood for the sake of Christ, that we should earnestly follow after sinlessness is demanded at our hands. Keep in remembrance, moreover, the healings which our Savior effected. He healed the sick, he cast out the devils, he made the lame to walk, he made the blind to see. Besides all these other healings which we put aside and do not attempt and describe one by one, and as the fulfillment of all these, he bestowed upon us the gracious gift of the way of entering into heaven, so that we ourselves might follow in his footsteps by means of a life of noble and virtuous deeds, and might make for ourselves our citizenship in the heavens, in a manner suitable for the place wherein our names are inscribed. Now the scripture hath called us strangers and sojourners, so that we may think scorn of the things of this place, i.e. the world. The pleasure of this world is like unto a day. If we chase him away, he fleeth. And if we feed him, he will abide with thee. It is for this reason that James said, Resist ye the devil, and he shall flee from you. Let us not think in our minds that we shall be able to repent in a mente, for the medicine of repentance hath no effect in that place. For though we shall gnash with our teeth, and our tongue shall be on fire, 
there shall be in that place none who shall dip his finger in water for us. On the contrary, we ourselves shall hear the words which the rich man heard. Let us know then, O my beloved, that the works of this changing world are nothing but phantasms, and that we live in a house wherein travelers are received, out from which we must go forth in any case. Let us take care concerning the road, and concerning the provisions which we must take with us on the road. Let us array ourselves in the garments which appertain to this life, concerning which Paul counseled us, saying, Dress yourselves in the bowels of mercies, and in goodness and in humility. In that place we shall have no need of gold, but we shall have need of the dropping of water. We shall have no need of the leaves of trees and plants, but of the fruit thereof. We shall have no need of words, but of deeds. For he, i.e. Christ, said, It is not every one who shall say unto me, Lord, Lord, that shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Let us therefore by no manner of means deceive ourselves. And if any man shall pass the whole of his life in eating at fasts and in drinking of wine, that period of time will be as nothing compared with the ages which shall follow it without end. For in this world both the good things and the evil things which are therein fulfill themselves. In that world, however, the good things endure and exist for ever and ever, and the punishments are endless. In this world, if the body burneth, the soul cometh forth therefrom, and it existeth undestroyed. In that world, even though the body rise up and exist in an undestroyed form, the soul shall burn for all time. And if it be necessary that sinners shall rise up and exist in an undestroyed form, this shall not happen in order that they may receive glory, but only that they may be punished with the punishments which are deathless. If a man be unable to bear the heat of the bath, which hath been heated to an unwanted degree, what will he do when he is delivered over to the fire of hell, which floweth before the throne of Christ? It is necessary that every man should make himself to consider the fire which is there. Let us examine carefully the seal which is on our gold, and see if it is intact. Lest peradventure some come and plunder our treasure, now all our works may be able to constrain him that hath speech with us, to think us good, but it is impossible that we should be able to deceive the judge who is in the other world. As long, then, as we have time, come ye and let us heal the wound in our souls by means of our tears. If the prophet Jeremiah wept over the overthrow of the temple, which had been built throughout with stones of price, saying, Leave me alone, let me weep bitterly. How much more is it right for us to weep over the temple of ourselves, which is exceedingly glorious, and which, though it hath not therein the ark of gold, is nevertheless the dwelling place of the Holy Trinity. If we look upon one who is dead, we weep over him according to custom. What man is there who would be altogether so foolish as not to weep for his own soul, if it had died in sin. For this reason it is seemly to weep not over the dead body, but over the death of thy soul. Remember thou, then, that the time hath drawn nigh, that the judge standeth at the door, the evening approacheth, and the day hath declined. No man remaineth asleep, when once the night hath passed away, and the sun hath risen. Let us rise up out of the slumber of dreams, and let us bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. Even as it is written, repentance requireth not a long time, and very many of the martyrs received the crown for the repentance of a short time. And if we have committed the sins which lead unto death, let us not fall into a state of despair, for we have with us the medicines of salvation, that is to say, tears. And moreover, it belongeth to the nature of men to go astray in the work, but it is the work of Satan to persist in the going astray. For falling down is not a very evil thing, but the not rising up again after the fall is both an evil thing and destruction. For this reason our God cried out to us through the prophet, saying, There is no balsam in Gilead, or is there no physician in that place? Why then hath not the healing 
of the daughter of my people increased. If it should happen that any member in our body become diseased, are we not wont to send for the physicians, and to make all the haste possible, until we have healed that sick member in our body? When, however, the soul itself is sick, we are careless about it, and we take no care whatsoever about the healing thereof. Let us hold in fear him that hath the power to destroy our soul and our body in Gehenna. Come ye, let us flee into the sea of the mercy of God, before the time of the torturings. And let us say with the holy man David, Thou shalt wash me thoroughly therein, and I shall become whiter than snow. The good shepherd standeth, wishing to snatch away our souls from out of the mouth of the lion, before he is able to devour them. He crieth out unto us ourselves, saying, My son, thou hast sinned, do not sin again. Or shall not he who hath gone astray turn again into the right way? And again he saith, Turn ye yourselves unto me, O my children, who have wandered afar off, and I will heal your wounds of contrition. He was no liar who said, I have not come to judge the world but in order that the world might have salvation through me. The one thing for us to do is to repent. For he saith, I do not desire the death of a sinner, but that he would turn himself from his evil way and live. There is no man among those who love persons, who even if he be consumed with the madness of love for the woman who is his beloved, that can love wholly in the same manner as that in which God loveth the soul which repenteth. For though it hath committed fornication very many times, he crieth out unto it, saying, And I spake unto her after she had committed fornication with all these, i.e. her lovers, saying, Return thou unto me. For the loving kindness of God towards man is in this wise, he never rejecteth him that setteth forth to come to him with repentance. And if he hath fallen into the ditch and into evil, yet will he stretch out widely his hands to him, saying, Turn thou to me, and I will save thee. And again, On that day wherein ye shall hear his voice, harden ye not your hearts. Doth there exist a physician who, supposing it to be his wish, to make him that is sick to recover a little, would reproach him? The physician does not treat him with contempt, nor doth he ward him the just retribution for his disgraceful state. But he administereth unto him the medicine with gentleness. How much more then shall God, who is in truth the good physician of our souls, act thus towards us? Above all things, let us not despair of our own salvation. For he who contendeth in the games is wont to fall down often. But in the end he riseth up and receiveth the crown of victory. So also is it with the soldier, after he hath been wounded, the physicians heal him, and he wageth war again. And men consider him to be of greater value than those who have not been wounded at all. Similarly, also there are very many merchants who, although their ships have floundered, and they have lost their cargoes, do not despair. But they go back again regularly to the markets, and they amass riches. For the burning fire of Gehenna hath not been prepared solely for us, but it was made ready for the devil and his angels. Above all things, let us not kindle that fire for ourselves, and let us hear besides the words, Get ye into the fire which ye yourselves have kindled. There is no sick man living who cannot be healed by the medicine of the physician of our souls. But perhaps thou wilt say, I certainly cannot attain unto perfection. If thou art not able to attain unto perfection, and if thou art not able to become like a sun, then make thyself to be like unto a star. In any case, transfer thyself from earth to heaven. Make thyself to be like a star, which sendeth forth light. It is very much better that thou shouldest do a few works which are good, than that thou shouldest do nothing at all. Thou hast been informed concerning the cup of cold water, and concerning the visiting of those who are sick, and those who are in prison. Moreover, if we shall be punished for our words and for our deeds, how much more shall he give us wages for our good works, 
even though they be very few. Therefore, let us labor for a little time, so that we may at last live the life which is forever. If it were possible for us to die many, many times, it would be seemly for us to do so, so that we might see Christ coming in his glory. We shall not see him in a riddle, but we shall see him as he really is, with our own eyes, according to the testimony of the Apostle John, who preached concerning God. If we look upon the beauty of the human body in this place, i.e., the world, we are wont to marvel thereat. Now the beauty of human bodies ariseth from humors, and from heat, which after death turns into worms and ashes and corruption. How much more, then, shall we admire when we look upon that beauty which is incorruptible and spotless and pure? Since Peter, when he saw only the very smallest portion of the light of the glory thereof, said, It is good for us to remain in this place. What shall happen unto us when we shall look upon the fullness of that glory? If we ascribe blessings to those who are nigh unto the king in this world, when we see him advancing upon a chariot of gold, and wearing the crown and apparel of purple, then how greatly blessed shall we be when we are placed on the right hand of the king of all, the judge of every man. Now supposing that a kingdom had been promised unto thee, and that the road to the country wherein the kingdom was situated was exceedingly difficult and toilsome, and was a place of desolation and steepness, wouldst thou not endure all these things in order to reach that kingdom? Thou shalt not say, I am already snared by my sins, I am not able to turn myself to God. For even if the devil hath first of all cast us down headlong, let us rise up quickly. For our God is a lover of mankind. Whomsoever shall flee unto him, he will receive, even as he did in the case of the young man who had squandered the portion of the riches, which had fallen to his share. Let us keep in remembrance the fact that after Solomon became king, and had obtained experience of all the glorious things and delights of life, he said, It is vanity, and vanity it is which is in them all. If the governor of the city taketh the greatest pains in order to be praised by those who are sitting in the theater, notwithstanding the fact that the greatest number of those who are sitting in that place are poor men, and men of humble station and servants and strangers, how very much more pains ought we to take to cause ourselves to be well spoken of in that theater of the other world, wherein are congregated the angels and the archangels and all the saints. Let no whoremonger and tax-gatherer be before us to enter into the kingdom. There are many medicines and many remedies established for us in Holy Scripture, which are different from each other. Ahab sorrowed in his heart because of the sin which he had committed, and he escaped from the wrath of God by means of this medicine. And Nebuchadnezzar escaped through mercy. The inhabitants of Nineveh escaped through the medicine of fasting. The harlot reconciled God to her through her tears. The thief became a citizen of the paradise through faith. Therefore we will exalt these salves and these medicines. Let us heal our souls of the wounds of sin, which we our own selves have caused. Let us ourselves say unto the true physician, Heal me, O God, and I shall become whole, and heal my soul, for I have sinned against thee. And the true physician shall receive us unto him, and he shall say, I, even I, am he who blotteth out thy sin, and I will remember it no more. Thou seest then the vast number of the medicines and salves, each of which is different from the other, which have been transmitted unto us in mercy by the physician for use on various kinds of sores, and on diverse cuts and bruises. Choose thou from among these that which thou wishest for the healing of thy soul. If now thou art not able to perform mercy like Nebuchadnezzar, nor to grieve in thy heart over thy sins like Ahab, and if thou art not able to fast like the inhabitants of Nineveh, and if thou canst not wash away thy sins by means of thy tears like the harlot, flee thou to the foot of the merciful, and thou thyself shalt say with David, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to the greatness of thy mercy. 
it is not a viper which hath bitten me, or I would have fled to the feet of the man of enchantments. Neither am I filthy with the mire, nor would I have washed myself clean in water. But it is the devil who hath cast his venom upon me, and I have been penetrated by the mire of iniquity. For this reason I am in need of the greatness of the mercy of thy loving kindness towards man. Thou must in any case go to him, that thou must make supplication to him, and he will graciously bestow upon thee the mercy of the Father, and the mercy which he spake, saying, If the unrighteous man will turn from his evil way, I will no longer keep in remembrance all the iniquities which he hath committed. Nevertheless, thou must certainly show him thy wound, and thou shalt say, Have mercy upon me, have mercy upon my body and upon my soul. Have mercy upon me in this world, and in that one which is to come. Have mercy upon me because of the weakness of nature, and because of the sea of thy goodness. Do thou desire earnestly healing, and the physician will be ready to heal thee at the earliest moment with his medicine. For he who seeketh after thy salvation is he who brought back the sheep which have gone astray. And he it is who sendeth forth his servant into the highways to invite both the wicked and the good to the marriage feast. Behold, he himself will sell unto thee the kingdom which is in the heavens. If thou art not able to buy it for copper, buy it for thyself with a little piece of bread, for he will sell thee the kingdom which is in the heavens for this. Behold, the prophet crying out, saying, who is the man who is wishing for life, and who would see the days that are good? That is to say, to receive for yourselves a fine external appearance, and the service of servants. Now he who seeketh after that which is sold may not have with him the means to give in exchange for it. If thou hast not these things, then give the innocence of thy soul, give fastings, Give tears, if thou hast nothing else whatsoever to give, then give the cessation of thy tongue from that which is evil, and the cessation of thy lips from speaking guile. This shall be the beginning of the salvation of thy soul, but take good heed unto thyself. If thou dost fast, guard thyself, lest thy heart become proud. If thou dost acts of mercy, Watch thyself that thou doest them not for the approbation of men. Nay, more than this, if the day of fasting shall cause thee to be regarded by men with close attention, thou shalt consider what it is which thou hast acquired for thyself through the fasting, lest thou find thyself to be on a lower level than before thou didst fast. Moreover, observe what kind of sin it is which thou hast abandoned, or for what purpose thou hast abandoned it, and what kind of success it is which thou hast acquired for thyself, or what manner of defect it is which thou hast corrected through thy fasting. See if thou hast made wrath to cease in thee, and if thou hast driven anger forth from thee. See if thou hast cured thyself of thinking scorn of thy brother, and of uttering calumnies concerning him, and of feelings of hatred towards thy neighbors. See if thou hast cured thyself of cursing and swearing, and if thou hast laid aside words of obscenity, or words of rebellion, or words of lewdness. See what manner of good thing it is which thou hast gotten for thyself. If thou hast abandoned the eating of bread overmuch, and of other kinds of food, but hast not abandoned passion, nor hast gotten for thyself spiritual excellences, in what way then hast thou benefited by the fasting? Thou shalt not say, Who is the man that will hold me up to contempt? I myself will hold him up to contempt. Who is he that will destroy my reputation? I myself will destroy his reputation. Who is he that will do wrong unto me? I myself will wreck my vengeance upon him. Do not this, believe the matter to the true judge, who shall reward to each man according to his works. For all these things shall be made manifest, and they shall all be put to the proof in that theater wherein the whole world shall be gathered together. 
In that other world, one man shall not be able to give another to help, and no man shall be able to deliver himself from the decision of the judge, wherefrom no escape may be obtained by supplication. In that place of judgment, neither Moses, nor Noah, nor Daniel, nor even Abraham himself, the lover of children, shall be able to protect one of his children from the punishment. Let us keep in remembrance the fact that we are guilty of very many sins, both of those which are secret and those which are manifest. Now he, i.e. David, saith, If thou shalt mark carefully every iniquity, who is there that shall stand? And why need I speak of the sins which are hidden? If he were to judge us only for those which are manifest, what chance of escape would there be for us? If he were to inquire closely into our conduct, or if he were to investigate our remissness in prayer and our faint-heartedness, what chance of escape would there be for us? And when we stand in his presence, how do we place ourselves? And on what do we meditate? We do not even pay unto him the honor which servants pay to their masters, or the respect which soldiers pay to their captains, or the honor which friends pay to their friends. Now when we talk with their friends, we are in the habit of addressing them with the greatest respect and deference. But when we pray to God himself for our sins, we habitually do this with carefulness. And although our knees are bent on the ground, our hearts themselves are imagining that they are occupied in the performance of worldly affairs. If God were to inquire carefully into this manner, where should we be able to stand? If, moreover, he were to bring forward, or into the midst, the charges which we have uttered against each other, and the jealousy and the hatred, what should we do? If also he were to examine carefully, in respect of looking upon our neighbors, with ill intent, what should we do? And if he were to search into us carefully, in respect of our evil desires, and if he were to demand from us our words of abuse, would any of us be able to open our mouths? Moreover, if he were to judge us for our love of the approbation of men, which we have mingled with our prayers and fastings, and acts of mercy, should we ever be able to look boldly into heaven at all? If he were to look closely into our behavior, in respect of the acts of deceit, which we have done to each other, and of how, when our brother was present with us, we held converse with him as a friend. But when he was absent, he heaped abuse of every kind upon him, as if he had been an enemy. What should we do? If he were to make a reckoning with us with respect of our false oaths, and our lies, and our wrath without cause against each other, and our malicious feelings, and our emotions of grief, when we saw any one of our friends held in honor, by men or praised more than ourselves, and our feelings of joy, when certain folk fell into evil and calamity, should we not be condemned to most severe punishment because of our behavior in this respect? If he were to exact punishment from us for our carelessness in our assemblies for the Holy Communion, wherein God himself speaketh to us in the scriptures, but we pay no attention to him, and we hold converse with our fellow servants, should we not then be condemned to a punishment of greater severity because of our behavior in this respect? For this reason, let us set Gehenna before our eyes at all seasons. And even if we had not been threatened definitely with Gehenna, it would have been meet for us to keep our sins in our memory at all times. And seeing that this Gehenna is ready for us, how much more are we bound to keep our sins in remembrance? Remember thou the judge. For behold, he, i.e. the book, spake unto thee aforetime concerning the punishment, so that thou mightest make thy escape from the danger. If he were to command thee, saying, Fast thou, thou couldst find an excuse for not doing so in thy weakness. If he were to say unto thee, Give money in charity, thou couldst find an excuse for not doing so in thy poverty. If he were to say unto thee, Collect nothing in this world, thou couldst find an excuse in the necessity for providing for thy son. But if he were to say unto thee, Be not angry, bear no malice against, have no hatred for, treat not with contumely him that is thy neighbor, what wouldst thou reply in respect of these things? 
since therefore there is no apology for thee whatsoever, and there is no means of escape from these things in this respect, how wilt thou be able to lift up thy hands to heaven, seeing that these things are in thy soul? End of Homily 1 Part 1Homily 1, Part 2, of Coptic Homilies in the Dialect of Upper Egypt, by E. A. Wallace Budge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Moreover, on many occasions thou hast said, They have treated me unjustly, they have defrauded me of my poverty, they have done me an injury, they have spoke evil things against me. But thou hast only to wait for the decision of the governor. If a servant were to treat thee with insolence, wouldst not thyself beat him, but wouldst make an accusation against him to his master? How much more is it meet for thee to leave the matter upon him who said, Cast the judgment upon me, I will repay, saith God. Thou knowest, therefore, that it will be necessary for thee to take thy stand before the awful throne, where neither advocate nor possessions shall be able to assist thee and that thy soul shall come forth on the river of flame which floweth from the throne of Christ, even as the fathers say who have been in that place before thee. Let the fountain of thy tears be in size according to the measure of the sins which thou hast committed. If thy sins be few, then a little shedding of tears will suffice. If thy transgression be great, then thou wilt have need of overwhelming torrents of tears. If, however, thou thyself art free from sin, then shed thou thy tears on behalf of thy brother to a suitable degree, and weep with him for his sins. The place through which sin entereth is the eye. Let then healing come through the eye. Let us repent before the door of repentance, be shut in our teeth. For this reason was said, that which was said, let him that thinketh he stand look carefully lest he fall. Let him that is in a slippery place and hath fallen make haste to rise up again, for he must not abandon himself to despair. For it is written, God upholdeth those who fall. And it happeneth that a man moveth sometimes a very little, according to that which David spake, saying, As for me, a very little more, and my feet would have moved and a very little more, and my steps would have slipped. And again I say, My feet move, but thy grace, O God, helpeth me. Then again, they thrust sore at me to make me fall, but God give me his hand. He who hath fallen hath in these examples an encouragement not to allow himself to remain in his fallen state. And he, i.e. the book, saith, Shall not he that is in the habit of falling rise up again? Watch, however, lest, having heard of the goodness of God, thou becomest careless. Verily it is written, God the true judge is long-suffering and merciful, and he receiveth the repentance of those who shall turn unto him, as one who loveth men. But the book saith, If ye will not turn yourselves, he will sharpen his sword. Listen, for the book saith, He will sharpen it. Now hitherto he hath not made use of it to smite, for he thought that when thou didst see him sharpening his sword, thou wouldst anticipate the passing of the sentence, and that fear would rouse thee up to repentance. For the book saith, He has stretched his bow, he hath made it ready. Because thou hast not yet seen the arrow, presume not on the mercifulness of the judge. Listen to the words of the long-suffering, of the Savior who said, Agree thou with him that goeth the law with thee. Now the adversary, that is to say, he that fighteth with thee, is with thee at all times, and that it is unlikely that thou wilt be able to rid thyself of him. Paul teacheth thee, saying, The flesh lusteth against our spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. These, moreover, war against each other, now the spirit warreth against the flesh, and it bringeth into subjection the lust of this world through the hope of the kingdom which is in the heavens. The flesh itself warreth against the spirit, and it inclineth towards the earth and the pleasures thereof. Agree thou therefore with him 
that goeth the law with thee, whilst he is still with thee in the way. For when the way hath come to an end, thou wilt no longer find any opportunity for repentance. Watch thou then carefully, lest he that goeth the law with thee give thee over into the hand of the judge, and the judge give thee over into the hand of the attendant, that is to say, the merciless powers which are over the punishments, and they cast thee into prison, that is to say, the outer darkness, until thou pay the uttermost condratus. Moreover, they shall judge thee not only for thy deeds, but also for thy thoughts and for thy motives. Since therefore we know all these things, let us help ourselves, when we shall have actual experience of the punishments, when we shall know that bitter is pleasure, and then we shall have good reason for knowing how bitter that bitterness can be. Now therefore, since these things take place in this wise, O my beloved, let us make our appeal to the merciful God, not to deliver us over into the hands of the demons. Let us ourselves say with the holy man David, Give thou me not over unto those who would do violence unto me, for it is they who urge us on into sin straightway, and it is they who shall be our accusers in the day of judgment. Is it not the devil only, but all his angels also, who shall make accusations against us, saying, Were we not those who assisted you in committing fornication, and to be wroth, and to love vainglory, and in malicious calumnies? Let us then be afraid in our hearts of that day, and of that hour wherein our own power of reasoning shall be our sternest judge, and of that moment wherein we shall see them, i.e. our sins, all standing before us, clearly depicted in our sight, as if they were actual images. And let us cry out to our God with all our hearts, for even if the flesh which is on us be weak, yet he who is ready to help us is mighty, and he will give us salvation in his kingdom. Now we ourselves love a certain man for one of three things, either because of his goodness, or because he loveth us ourselves, or because of his beauty. But what other kind of beauty is there which can be compared with that which belongeth to our God? Even as David spake, saying, He is fairer in his beauty than the children of men. Moreover, who is there that doth such good things that he will prepare for those who love him the good things which the eye hath not seen, nor the ear heard of, nor hath the conception thereof entered into the hearts of men? Moreover, who is there who hath loved us as our God and Father hath loved us? He crieth out, saying, Doth there exist a mother who forgetteth her son? Or doth there exist a bride who shall forget the bridal adornments which have been given to her? Or doth there exist a virgin who shall forget the girdle wherewith she bindeth herself? Yet I will not forget, saith God. Consider how the blessed man David, and how great was the desire which he had to see God. For he said, When shall I come and appear before the face of my God? He did not wish to wait until the appointed time in his life, but he burned with desire to come forth from this place, and to see him whom he loved. Such desire and such readiness appertain to the soul of the philosopher, which took to itself wings and flew up into the sky. Moreover, thou thyself shalt love this God only, and thou shalt pass by all the works of this life as if they were shadows. Keep thou in remembrance at all times the life which shall be forever, and the kingdom which shall endure, and the existence with the choirs of angels, and the imperishable glory, and the living of the life with Christ, wherein there shall be no sorrow of heart whatsoever. For the scripture saith, Sorrow of heart and grief and sighing shall flee away. And continue to remember this life, wherein there is nothing but grief and weeping and sadness of heart and contumely, and carelessness, and sin, and suffering, and old age, and death. Now David saw these things, and more than these, that is to say, calumny, and widowhood, and sudden death, and retribution for sin, and the fallings into tribulations of all kinds, which are incidental to citizenship in this life, and he earnestly desired to escape from all these troubles. 
and he said, When shall I come and appear before the face of my God? He wished to depart from this place, and to enter into the place wherein are peace and gladness and love and splendor, and freedom from care, and all the good things which no words can possibly present to the mind. For this reason, since thou thyself hast the hope of enjoying such great delights as these, do not thou treat the matter of thy life with contempt. Let thy lamp be kept burning every day, and be thou prepared to meet the bridegroom, so that thou thyself mayest hear the words, Enter into the joy of our God. It is right, therefore, for us to keep watch, and to pray at all times. For if after God spake unto the devil, saying, Lay not thy hands upon my servant Job, he still continued to hope that he would be able to cast him down. How much more will he fight against us who are under his hand? And if he is not to cast us down, we shall have need of long nights of protracted watching to guard our souls thereby. Now the soldier is accustomed to keep watch very many nights when on the march, and the fisherman doth not sleep, but keepeth watch the whole night long, until he hath caught a multitude of fishes. Similarly also the husbandman is accustomed to keep watch throughout the night, so that no person may destroy his vineyard. And the sheep also keepeth watch all night, guarding his flocks of sheep, even as the patriarch Jacob spake, saying, I was consumed by the fiery heat in the daytime, and by the cold of night, and sleep departed from my eyes. And for what reason did he pass such long nights of vigil? He did so because, he said, peradventure some wild beast will destroy one of the sheep. Now if he took all this care for the sake of a sheep, which is without reason, it is meet that we should take far greater care of our soul, which hath reason, and is far more precious than any other thing whatsoever. And it is the soul which they will place before the awful throne, and make to defend itself for all that it hath done. For this reason, moreover, let us set down the burden of our sins from our shoulders, before the place of judgment is made ready. For it is unlikely that we shall be able to repent in that place, i.e. in the world to come. For this same reason we shall be condemned to come forth, from the body which shall be hidden from us, in order that we may be in terror at all times. For if in a court of justice in this world men are terrified, and become as cold as ice through fear when they hear the voice of the court crier proclaiming the names of those who have been condemned, how much more should those be terrified who are destined to take their stand before the awful throne, in the midst of thousands of thousands, and tens of thousands of tens of thousands of angels? And consider the blessed man Jacob, who, having set a stone under his head, slept and saw a ladder upon the earth, the top whereof reached up into the sky, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it, and they were bearing our prayers up to God, and bringing to us blessings from his hand. It must be, moreover, that all these keep their gaze upon us, nay, more than this, they must be sorrow at heart for us, if they have joy concerning us when we repent. In like manner, they must be sorrowful in heart concerning our carelessness, for at all times our conscience accuses us and chideth us for what we have done, more especially when we speak concerning the judgment which is to come. Moreover, the correction which is the result of the words which are good is wholesome. Would that that rich man had been rebuked on earth, for when his tongue would not have been consumed in the fire, which cannot be extinguished. If thou desirest earnestly virginity, and thou dost keep the commandments, God will bestow it upon thee in full measure. And if thou shalt say, when thou prayest, Keep me, O God, as the apple of thine eye, he himself shall say unto thee, Keep thou my words and my commandments as the apple of thine eye. When thou keepest his commandments, he himself shall take care of thy soul. And thou shalt say concerning thyself, Whosoever toucheth thee, shall be as one who toucheth the apple of his eye. And, O beloved, now that thou hast set thy hand to the plow, do not turn back, and thou shalt not become like a pillar of salt. 
Let thy tongue speak at all times concerning the judgment which is to come, and make thou thyself to be useful, and thou shalt become a chosen man through the fear of the place of judgment in the other world. Let neither anger have dominion over thee, nor grief, nor any feeling of passion whatsoever, and utter not vain words without consideration. On the contrary, let the law of God be at all times in thy mouth, so that thine eye shall pass through all these things, and thy speech shall be according to the law of God. Set thou a giver of the law before thine eyes at all times, and let him continue to abide with thee, and let him be unto thee a counselor. And if thou shalt see one who fareth delicately, and who enjoyeth himself in great riches, know thou that he shall wither suddenly like the grass of the field. Let him fare delicately in his eatings and feastings, but do thou nourish thyself on the words of God. Many of the virgins have become martyrs, and since they conquered death, even though some of them were women, it is not meet that thou who art a man shouldest gain the victory over desire. Strive thou with all thy might to make thy members creatures of sacrifice, so that thou mayest conquer not only thy desire, but also that thou mayest have rule over pride and wrath. Let there be a measure set for thy tongue, and take heed that thou doest not make thy conscience to pass sentence upon thee before the condemnation. Remember thou that of necessity all our works shall be made manifest. No man desireth that even one person shall see us in this world if we are put to shame. Then where shall we hide ourselves? In that other world among the thousands of thousands and ten thousands of ten thousands of angels. Now John, because he was a holy virgin, reclined upon the breast of Jesus. Let that soul which wisheth to become the bride of Jesus Christ guard carefully its innocence, for the tree is known by its fruit, and the righteous man declareth the faith which is manifest. Remember thou at all times the good confession of Christ, which hath entered into thine heart. Remember thou the last day. Make thou thyself secure on every side, especially in the matter of thy tongue. For the scripture saith, The tongue is that which polluteth the whole body. When the body is polluted, it is a necessity that the heart also should be corrupt therewith. Therefore well hath Paul said, Men whose hearts are evil, and evil words corrupt the hearts which are good. Seek thou after Paul, even as did the blessed woman Thecla, so that thou mayest hear the words of Paul. Thou hast need of wings, and if thou hast no wings, thou wilt find it vain to attempt to fly. Let thine eyes look downwards upon the ground, but let thy heart be in the height of heavens. Thou hast need of great soberness, for thine adversary standeth against thee, and he is wary. He was cast forth from paradise, which was upon the earth, and he seeth now, as thou enterest into heaven, and is not unmindful of it. Hearken unto the word of him that saith, I wish that ye may be without care. Let there be no care whatsoever to thee about anything, except only that which concerneth the kingdom which is in the heavens. If thou wishest to enter into heaven with the body, from the earth subdue thou the flesh by means of fasting, and then thou shalt be able to make it to enter into the height with ease. If a horse be accustomed to eat large quantities of food, he is able neither to gallop quickly nor to make long marches, and he is unable to do regular work. Had Israel not eaten and waxed fat, he would not have kicked. Lift up thine eyes to the heavens, wherein is he whom thou lovest, and thou shalt overcome passion by means of the love which is holy. Prayer and faith shall keep thee, and the Holy Scripture shall give thee instruction, and thou shalt have from this world, according to his pledge to us, the rest which is in the heavens. Abide not with a woman who shall make thee to offend. Have no care for a child, and avoid thou the care which appertaineth to the rearing of a child. Follow thou after thy God, who shall be the guide of thy heart into the kingdom which is in the heavens. Follow thou after him who saith unto thee, If ye shall come to me in rectitude, 
I myself will come to you in rectitude. If thou wishest to be like unto Christ, follow thou in his footsteps. Narrow is the gate and difficult, and it is only the righteous who enter in through it. Hearken unto the blessed man Daniel, who saith, I, Daniel, was in sore grief for three weeks. I ate no bread with desire, and neither flesh nor wine entered into my mouth. And John, who dwelt in the desert, did not cultivate a vineyard for himself, in order that he might not make himself to be a being attached to the earth. Let these be unto thee examples, which have been prepared to instruct thee. Thou shalt choose for thyself the citizenship which appertaineth to heaven. Fight thou the good fight of faith, and look eagerly beyond it to the crown of righteousness, and let thy career be strenuous. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Hast thou not observed the statues of emperors, and noticed that some of them are large and beautifully adorned, whilst others have become black through time, and have decayed, and have become objects of derision? Thus shall all our works appear in that other world which is to come, even as the statues. Let us flee from that shame which shall be forever. Let us say, Guard me, O God, for in thee have I set my hope. Thou hast no need of good gifts, for he hath no need whatsoever of anything that belongeth to us, except only the salvation of our souls. Therefore let us offer ourselves as a living holy sacrifice, as it is written, I am not to be propitiated with a burnt offering, but with mercy and patient endurance. For he spake, saying, He that shall endure patiently to the end shall be saved. And again the book saith, He hath suffered for ever, he shall live to the end. Therefore, as we would choose for ourselves a life free from care and free from disturbance, let us run wisely so that we may obtain, even as it is written, it is not a few dangers which should make us to break the agreement which we have made with God. For this reason, let us teach our tongue, let us teach our eyes, let us lift up in prayer our hands which shall be clean, and let us make our feet to walk in rectitude. Create for thyself a citizenship which shall be good, and without blemish, by means of humility and shamefacedness and calmness of mind and body, and temperance in eating, and the continence which is effective, and the love of strenuous toil and sympathy and brotherly love, and the sharing of our possessions with our neighbors, and the faith which is perfect. Now these are only a very few of the qualities of which we make mention in this case, and they need great striving to make them to flourish. The book saith, The kingdom which is in the heavens is like unto ten virgins. It doth not say that it is like unto the sun, or the moon, or the beautiful hosts of the stars, or the gold which is incorruptible, or the beauty which fadeth away, or even the sky itself. Observe the exalted reputation of purity, for it entereth into everything, and it is this of which Paul the sponsor spake, saying, I would that ye should be without carefulness. Therefore, what is seemly for us to do is to pray, so that those who are strong among the virgins may remain permanent in their healthy state, and that those who are sick, who have actually fallen into sin, may receive healing. Now it is seemly that we ourselves should weep in such a manner that we may wash out our eyes, which have been seeing badly. Thou seest the wound, and thou knowest what will heal it. Fortify thou the windows of thy soul, and not only thine ears and thine eyes and thy mouth, for these are the entrances through which the evil one is wont to come in. Even as it is written, Death hath entered in through your windows. Let the commandments of holiness be upon thine eyes and upon thine ears. Let the psalms be in thy mouth, and meditation on the scripture in thy heart. Therefore it is seemly for us to open our windows, that is to say, our senses or feelings to God, and to shut them fast against the adversary. Say thou, moreover, with that holy soul, I will go up into the palm tree, and I will lay hold of the height thereof. That is to say, I will lift up my mind into the heavens. I will lay hold upon the true faith, and I will not concern myself with the things of this earth. Take thou, however, good heed unto thyself, lest there be thorns in the palm tree. That is to say, 
admonishings, when thou art driven to follow after sin. For the book saith, The words of the wise are as ox goads, and the nails which are sharp, so that whilst these remain fixed in thy heart, thou shalt abstain from every sin. Now the book saith, Lay hold upon the height thereof, in order that thou mayest be above the sky, and be able to bear the temptations which shall come upon thee. From time to time, and at all times, rehearse the holy scriptures, for as the wine which men drink assuage grief, and changeth the sadness of the heart into joy, even so doth the spiritual wine which is distributed throughout the scriptures make the soul which hath partaken thereof to rejoice. Let the remembrance of God be in thy heart at all times, and thou thyself shall say with David, I see God face to face at all times. He is on my right hand, therefore shall I never be moved. Let these words be written on thy hands, and fixed firmly before thine eyes. If thou wilt ascribe glory to God by reason of his commandments, he shall be on thy right hand. If thou treat him with contempt, through thy transgressions, the devil shall be on thy right hand. For thus does scripture bear witness concerning Judas, who made himself to be an assistant of the devil. Let the devil stand on his right hand. Ascribe thou glory unto God at all times, and say, I will exalt thee, O my God and King. Thou shalt glorify him through thy works, and not through thy words only. In this wise did David ascribe glory to God, and he said, I will bless thee for ever and for ever and ever. He did not glorify him for a day, neither for a month, nor for a year, but throughout his life. For he well knew that if a man made perfect his glorification of God, he would be only beginning. But thou wilt say often, What manner of heart is it that is able to ascribe glory to God at all times? Now the heart is even as the blessed man Paul wrote, I know not how to do anything whatsoever. And again, it is even as David spake, saying, Cleanse me, O God, from my secret sins. And our heart must be like unto that which the Savior commanded us to make for ourselves, saying, Blessed are those who are pure in their hearts, for they shall see God. Thus it is with the man who committeth no sin against God, and who ascribeth glory to God through his words and through his works. And if there cometh upon such a man who doeth such things, sickness or poverty or death, he shall not fall into despair, but he shall say with Paul, Who shall separate us from the love of God? And the words which follow these, Remember thou the day, that awful day, which shall be filled with quaking, and that moment when we shall take our stand before the holy throne, and shall have to defend every deed which we have done in this world. And when all the sins which we have committed shall be made to appear before the eyes of every one, and when there shall be revealed again to us those things which we had forgotten, in that place there shall be a river of fire, and the worm which is deathless. Remember that moment when the books of our hearts shall be opened, when they shall unroll them and read them aloud in the midst of the theater of that other world. Then shall all the works which we have done be laid bare, those which we have done openly, and those which we have done in secret, and the things which we have done in the night season, and those which we have done in the daytime, and those we have done inadvertently, and the faults of forgetfulness, and those which we have done with the members in the body, and those which we have performed in the dictates of our hearts. And in that hour everything which we have done during our whole lives, and every sin which we have committed in secret shall be revealed. Remember that it is necessary for us to transfer ourselves from this world, that we may appear before the judge whom it is impossible to deceive, who shall reveal the things which are hidden in darkness, who shall make manifest the counsels of hearts, and who shall try our works and our thoughts and our words. In that hour we shall receive a greater punishment for the sins which we have committed and which we imagined were few. Keep thou in thy remembrance at every hour the flame of Gehenna, which cannot be quenched, and forget it not, and set thou at all times before thine eyes the judge, who shall come to judge those who are living and those who are dead. Think moreover of the thousands of thousands, and the tens of thousands of tens of thousands, of angels who stand before the judge at all times, 
Let thine ears hear beforehand the sound of the trumpets, and the awful voice of that judge, and let thine eyes see beforehand the things which are ordained to take place. Now there shall be some whom they will cast forth into the outer darkness, and there are others who even after the fight and the suffering which they have endured for the sake of virginity shall have the door of the bridal chamber which is in the heavens shut against them. Look at certain of them and observe how they are tied up in bundles like garden waste and cast into the furnace of fire and see how they bind the hands and feet of others and cast them forth into the outer darkness and how certain of them are delivered over to the worm which sleepeth not and to the gnashing of teeth on one they pass the sentence of condemnation because he laughed the laugh of the scoffer and out of season and on the other because he offended his brother or because he behaved unjustly towards his neighbor and they judge another because of the sins which he committed in secret to another they assign retribution because of the idle words which he spake on the other they pass sentence of doom because of his evil mind on the face of another the door of the kingdom is shut because of the words of infamy which he has spoken another they deliver over to the punishment which is without healing because he did not hate the things which are evil another they deliver over to derision and shame forever and others who have shown themselves to be entirely destitute of the understanding of god shall hear i know you not whence are ye because they did in the course of their works things which were an abomination to christ these things then being thus in what manner it is meet for us to live we must devote ourselves daily to the shedding of torrents of tears and we must say with the prophet who will set a stream of water upon my head and a fountain of tears in mine eyes i will weep for my sins by day and by night so that I may be able to flee from the punishment which shall take place. Let us confess beforehand our sins, before we come to that awful place of judgment. Let us cry out to the mercy of God, so long as we are in this habitation. For the scripture saith, Who shall give thanks unto thee in a mente? Moreover, let us consider this, O beloved. God hath made for us all the members of our material body double, for he hath bestowed upon us two eyes, two ears, two hands, and two feet. If it should happen that one of these pairs becometh disabled through sickness, we are able to relieve our wants by using the other. The soul, however, which hath been made for us is one only, and if we destroy it through carelessness, by what manner of means shall we live? Let us take exceeding care that we do not permit anything whatsoever to become of more importance than the health of the soul. For it is the soul which will be set up to be judged, and it is the soul which will have to defend the body before the throne. If thou shalt say at that time to the judge, The possessions of this world outwitted me, he who judgest shall make an answer unto thee, saying, Didst thou then not hear me when I cried out to thee? And what shall a man be benefited, if he shall gain the whole world and suffer the loss of his soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? And he shall say unto thee, Moreover, Eve profited nothing when she said, The serpent deceived me. Further, O my brethren, let us set these things in our hearts. Come ye, let us rise up of ourselves with glad readiness. Come ye, let us ascribe glory to God, before the darkness cometh, and before there cometh upon us that great and shining day, concerning which the prophet spake, saying, Behold, God cometh. Who shall be able to abide the day in which he cometh? That day shall be a day of terror, a day of darkness and blackness, a day of cloud and gloom, a day of blasts of the trumpet. Peradventure thou wilt say, Who shall be able to escape all these things? Hearken, it is I who will tell thee. Now thou must not imagine that thou wilt escape merely by keeping thy body in a state of purity. On the contrary, these things also must thou do. Whensoever any man doeth unto thee that which is evil, thou must do unto him that which is good in return. Whensoever men make false accusations against thee, thou must continue to lead a well-ordered life. Whensoever men curse or revile thee, thou must bless them in return. 
whensoever thou shalt fast, thou shalt not be puffed up thereby. For it is not thine abstinence from eating only, which is true fasting, but also thy abstinence from sin. It is meet for us to search carefully the scriptures. For observe that it was a staff of wood, of the almond tree, which the prophet saw at the beginning. But afterwards it was a brazen vessel of fire, which actually appeared to him, which indicated that he who will not lay hold on the rod of correction in this world is he whom the fire of Gehenna shall put to the test in the next. Moreover, in this same manner did Moses teach the people, with a pillar of light and a pillar of fire. He cried out unto every one, saying, He who will hearken unto the law shall have enjoyment of the light, which is true and pleasant, and he who will not hearken will be delivered over to the fire. Read ye the Gospels, and ye shall know that when we shall go forth from this world, there shall be nothing whatsoever which will help us. No brother shall be able to set free another brother from the punishment which never endeth, and no friend shall be able to help his friend, neither shall fathers be able to help their children, nor children their fathers. But why should I speak of ordinary men in this manner? For neither Noah, nor Daniel, nor Job would be able to set free another son or daughter. Now many times thou wilt say to me, What is the proof of these words? I will tell thee. Consider the man who had not on him the wedding garment, and observe that after they cast him forth from the bridal chamber, there was not one of those who sat at meat who interceded for him. Consider, moreover, the servant unto whom the talent was given, and observe that after he had been cast forth into the outer darkness, there was no man who made an appeal on his behalf. Consider, moreover, the five virgins, and observe that after the door of the bridal chamber had been shut in their faces, none of their fellow virgins asked the bridegroom for a recompense for those whom Christ called foolish, although they had trampled underfoot the flame of pleasure, and had extinguished the fire of desire, and had kept protracted fasts, and had passed whole nights in vigil, and had slept on the ground. Although I say they had done all these things, he called them foolish, and in very truth rightly so. He called them by this name, because though they had observed the great commandment to guard their virginity with success, they had forgotten to observe the little commandment which inculcated charity. Think of the judge who setteth the sheep on his right hand, and the unfruitful goats on his left. Unto those who are on his right hand he saith, Come ye, and inherit the kingdom. And those who are on his left, he himself cast forth into the outer darkness. And none of those who are on the right hand is able to help them. Verily true is that proverb which saith, Behold, the man in his work. Behold, hast thou not heard concerning that rich man, between whom and Lazarus a gulf had been made, who wished him to sprinkle water on his tongue, as he was burning in the place of punishment? And thou sawest also that Abraham was not able to set the rich man free from the place of punishment, although the rich man entreated him to do so. Ought we not then to help ourselves in this world, and to ascribe glory to God before the darkness cometh? that is to say, before we are banished into the darkness. It is far better to have our tongues parched in this world by fasting than for us to wish to have water sprinkled upon it, in that place where water will not be given unto us. Let us put forth our utmost endeavor to free ourselves from this great torture through a few sufferings in this world. Remember when the fever of sickness cometh upon us, or a few disasters, or when we look upon those who are punished by the judges in this world, whereupon horror and quaking seize upon it, notwithstanding the fact that both the punishment and the place of judgment endure only for a very short space of time. Remember, I say, what manner of punishment it shall be in the place of judgment in the other world which is to come, wherein we shall be punished for endless ages. Ought we not therefore to make haste to enter in through the narrow gate, and not to walk about in the broad way? Now we know that all the works of the world are likened to dreams, and that they all pass away into destruction. For sickness bringeth to naught the strength of the body, and even the beauty of the bodily form decayeth through old age. And even if we enjoy the sight of a table heaped high with food, when the evening cometh we forget the pleasures thereof 
and in short everything which is in this world becometh like unto the web of the spider, and like unto dreams. Rightly therefore did the Saviour ascribe blessings to those who afflict themselves, so that the pleasures of this world may not prevail over them. Should not then we ourselves do as did Abraham, who hearkened unto the words, Get thee forth from thy country, and come forth from our iniquity. And let us pray with the holy man David, and say unto God, I will bless thee seven times in the day, because of the judgment of thy righteousness. Now it is a good occupation to hold converse with God at all times by means of prayer. If the friendship of a good man converteth him, that meeteth with him to that which is excellent, how much more will he be benefited who holdeth converse with God, by night and by day, by means of prayer? Now no man ever sinned who remembered that God was before him. Therefore ought we not to remember that which he said, pray at all times, in order that sin may not discover a way whereby to enter into our hearts through the practice of forgetfulness. Ponder beforehand upon the death which thou shalt die in thy members, which are upon the earth, and remember that the day of God shall come like a thief. When those who are to bear away thy soul shall come after thee, thou wilt say, Be merciful unto me, for I will fast and I will do deeds of mercy, I will repent. And they shall say unto thee, Didst thou then not hear God, who cried out, saying, The kingdom which is in the heavens hath drawn nigh? Didst thou then not hear him when he spoke, saying, Show mercy, and I will show mercy unto you? Didst thou then not hear Paul, saying, Whilst we have time with us, let us do the thing which is good? He who desires salvation hath no need of a long time for repentance. The thief had no need of a long time for repentance. He believed earnestly and he gained paradise. And the holy martyrs in a very little time inherited the kingdom which is in the heavens. They give their blood. Do thou give thy tears. He who said, I would that all men shall be saved, is no liar. For this reason he teaches us not only about the holy scriptures, but also about the misfortunes and sufferings of others. Moreover, we see physicians inflicting pain on men, and we also see the governors who sit on the seat of judgment, inflicting righteous punishment on the thieves. And this they do in order that, through the sufferings of others, we may be admonished. And now, O my beloved, since we are rooted in the faith, let us increase in knowledge. From knowledge let us proceed to love, and from this to the inheritance which is in the heavens. Let us persist obstinately in prayer, as it is written. Shepherds, even if there be no wolves about them, keep watch all night over their flocks of sheep. And even if there be no wild animals about them, their dogs keep watch for them. For this reason, it is good that we should continue to exercise ourselves and work at all times. And even if no temptations come upon us, the exercise will certainly do thee no harm whatsoever. Nay, on the contrary, thou wilt benefit thyself exceedingly. For who is the man who did not benefit himself by watching all night in prayer? Therefore it is meet for us to keep watch on every side, so that evil may not break into our souls. When once the soul has tasted sin, it will continue in a state of unconsciousness, and will go on adding greatly to the sickness of sin. For as when thou hast once kindled a fire, it burneth up quickly through the fuel above it, and flames burst out in all directions. Even so it is the case of the natural disposition of sin, which finally obtaineth the mastery over the reasoning power of the soul, and then destroyeth the whole soul itself, and the body also with it. For this reason, what we ought to do is to drive back, once and for all, the beginnings of sin, just as we should drive back a horse which is uncontrolled. If we take heed that we speak not idle words, how much more ought we do so in the case of the sins which lead to death? Let not the pleasure of the works of life lead us astray, for the works of men are in no wise different from dreams and shadows, and they are like the rushing torrent which floweth swiftly away. Hold not to be marvelous things the possessions and the riches of this world, but observe how they are transferred from this man to that and how they pass from that man to another. 
For this reason it is right that we should despise them. For very right is the word which is written that saith, The things which are seen are those that are for a time, whilst the things which are not seen are those which are for ever. The latter things are incorruptible and indestructible, and they abide without change. Let us therefore do our utmost to acquire these things for ourselves. Let us strive eagerly for these things, for otherwise it is unlikely that we shall be able to require any of these for ourselves, when we shall go forth from this life. For he who striveth in the contest receiveth not the crown if he abandon the contest. Therefore let us seize and carry off the crown, and we shall thus escape disgrace and loss. Now the scripture saith, He whose possessions are consumed with fire shall suffer loss. Now what kind of burning with fire is that which shall be to us? And what kind of thing is the utter darkness? And what kind of things are the place of weeping and of gnashing of teeth? Take these things into thy heart, and guard thou thy soul, and keep in virgin state, until the bridegroom cometh in his glory. And do thou sing psalms, saying, My soul is in thy hands at all times, I do not forget thy law. And say, Thou art he who doth deliver me from the snare of the hunter. Let thy lamp be burning, and permit not thyself to fall asleep. And if slumber be sweet to thee in the night season, yet know thou that there is nothing sweeter than the Psalms. For the holy man David said, Thy words are sweeter in my throat than honey in the mouth. The martyrs give their own souls for the name of God. Let us bring as an offering to him our life of self-denial. Remember that some of the martyrs were laid upon coals of fire. Let not, therefore, the matter seem to thee to be a hardship, if thou hast to sleep upon the ground, if thy mouth is wont to become foul and bitter through fasting. Remember that he who created the sweetness and the honey tasted gall for thy sake. Although thou mayest weep occasionally for thy sins, thou hast not as yet done as Paul did, who wept for the salvation of others. Let us address each other in these words. Suffering endureth only for a short time, but the resurrection is for eternity. Vanquish suffering by means of hope, for the scripture saith, Tribulation worketh patience, and patience hope, and hope giveth birth to shamefacedness. Consider, moreover, that pleasure endureth only for a short time, and that punishment lasteth for ever. Excuse thyself from the delight of pleasure, because of the tribulation of the punishment thereof. Cause not the devil to make use of our members as arrows against us, and guard thyself, and let him not transfix thee with the arrow of the appetite of the belly. For thou knowest that after the people of Israel had passed over the sea, without being drowned, Moses himself became master of the land through the appetite of the belly. Take good heed thyself to the sufferings of those who were there, and flee thou from their fall. If God did not give his people who were there water to drink, he will not give thee water to drink if thou practice carelessness. If thou shalt strive in the contest with thy whole heart, in perfect faith, thou shalt be happy in joy and in gladness for ever. Lay fast hold therefore at all times upon these teachings, which are full of salvation, and keep thou them and fulfill thou them, so that the Holy Trinity may be glorified through thee. Father, and Son, and Holy Spirit, henceforth and always, for all ages. Amen. End of Homily 1, Part 2also the explanation of Appa John, Archbishop of Constantinople, concerning Susanna. Once more we come unto you with great readiness, for we are in debt to you in respect of an address, not that we shall be able to discharge our obligation completely as is meet, but only to pay to you such things as we have according to our ability. Our willingness is manifest, and it giveth help, and it would pay more than we are liable to pay. Only the poverty of our speech afflicteth us, and for this reason we appeal to you to accept a very little instead of very much. 
Now if it be that each one of you who accepteth the very little will amplify it by the ready will of his heart, then we shall be found to be lacking in nothing whatsoever, and such portion as we lack our own ready mind shall make complete. Now as concerning the little offerings brought by the poor man, and the large offerings of the rich man, when God looketh upon them, he receiveth them to himself with equal honor. Nay, perhaps he inclineth more to the gifts of the poor man, for he looketh upon the willingness of the heart, rather than upon the abundance of the things offered. Let the proof of these words, moreover, be to you through the words of the poor widow, who threw two lepta into the treasury. For the honor of this offering was far greater in the sight of God than the gold which the rich men gave. For God hath need not of gold, but of a pure heart, and of the upright purpose, which is disposed towards that which is good. Now therefore we ourselves will enlarge our hearts in sincerity, and we will bring in this address as an offering to God, and will set it aside and cast it into the spiritual treasury. And thus shall we discharge our debt of a discourse to you. For I recall to my mind that I made the promise which I made to you yesterday that I would preach concerning the fortitude and prudence of Susanna, because this subject would be of very great advantage to many. Just as the story of the fight of Joseph in his chastity and in his contending is of very great benefit to man. Let moreover Susanna fight now as in a theater which is filled with the multitude. Let her fight in the place wherein God and his angels and men and women shall look upon her, and she shall teach young maidens to think scorn of death if it be incurred for chastity's sake. Now this blessed woman Susanna was of noble birth and race, and her bodily form was beautiful. She had been carefully secluded in her own chamber from her childhood, and having led a chaste life, she had grown to woman's estate. Now Satan had watched carefully her youthful beauty, and had joined herself in the bond of marriage according to the law. And she kept her husband's bed undefiled, and she observed the ordinances of her marriage. Her eyes never rested with pleasure upon the beauty of a strange young man, or searched it out. She neither allowed her ears to listen at any time to the words of lewd speech, nor did she permit her nostrils to snuff sweet scents, nor did she array herself in apparel which had been held over the smoke of burning perfumes. In short, she did not permit any one of her senses to carry her away with sudden swiftness, lest the chastity which she had set firmly in her heart should be destroyed, and her soul glide downwards into obscene pleasures through the deceit of apathy. Now the greater number of the sins which come into being in the soul arise from the senses, for the soul abideth in the heart, even as a virgin who liveth quietly in her chamber, and the five senses are the servants which minister unto her. Now the senses are the eye, that is to say, the sight and the hearing and the smelling and the taste and the touch. And if the soul be not led astray by any one of these senses, or corrupted thereby, it remaineth alone, and suffereth no injury whatsoever. If, however, it happen that the eye wandereth about, and doth contemplate the beautiful forms of young men, then do the waves of desire boil up in the soul, and overcome it, and the winds of passion beat down upon it straightway. And it wandereth away from chastity, and goeth into the gulf of sin, and is swallowed up in the vortex wherein David himself was engulfed. Moreover, it was he who cried out concerning himself, saying, I have come into the abyss of the sea, and the storm hath drowned me. So also is it in the case of the hearing. If the ear receiveth the pleasant voice, and the deceitful words of lewdness which accompany it, then doth the heart incline thereto, and they drag down the heart into destruction. And again, if the taste devoteth itself to continual eating and feasting, and to innumerable wine-bibbings, then doth it draw the soul downwards, and into darkness and into drunkenness. Yet again in the case of the smell, if the nose be in the habit of taking delight in the things which have sweet smells, that is, in scented unguents and in aromatic perfumes, and in bosoms, 
it falleth at length into a state of numbness, and it bindeth tightly the soul in that state of numbness along with it. Moreover, if the chaste soul be in any of these conditions, she hath made herself to be like unto a virgin who hath been delivered over into the hands of her servants, and hath slipped down into sin, and hath lost the power of holding herself back. For when once the habit of incontinence has entered into the soul, it acts the part of a thief, and it breaks into the treasury of the heart, which it makes into a desert, and it strippeth it naked, and leaveth it unchaste. Now this blessed woman, that is to say Susanna, kept guard over her eyes, and her hands and her feet, and her tongue and her nose, and over the whole system of her senses, and she became in very truth, according to the word of the wise man, like a garden enclosed, and a fountain which hath been sealed, which no man was able to strip bare, and no man was able to destroy the abiding place of the sweet-smelling flowers of chastity, and to ravage and to lay waste that place of beauty wherein was the fountain of discretion. Now there were two elders, who were held in high esteem, as men who governed the people, and these men lusted after this woman, and though both were being consumed by the burning of their lust, they were ashamed to make known to each other concerning the fire which was burning in their hearts. And it came to pass on a certain day that each of them went into a secret place where they could watch Susanna carefully, and they met each other face to face. And when each had questioned the other, each confessed to the other for what purpose he had come there. Then they made an agreement, each with the other, to commit a deed of sin, and to work iniquity together, and they kept watch over her diligently and waited for a time when they should find her alone. Then it came to pass that on a certain day Susanna went into her husband's garden to lie down and rest there, according to her custom, during the hottest season of the day. And she sent away her servants to bring to her the soda and soap wherewith to wash herself. And the elders suddenly rushed into the place where she was, even as wolves rush upon a lamb of the sheep, and they laid hold upon her, and then wished to work in her the deed of impurity of their burning lust. Now Susanna was between the two elders, who were far more evilly minded than the lions among which Daniel found himself. There was neither a servant with her, nor a neighbor, nor any person of her acquaintance, nor any young maiden, and there was no one there to render her help in any way whatsoever, God himself alone excepted, who was watching her from heaven. Now God had the power to prevent them from gaining the mastery over her, but he permitted them to engage in the contest, in order that the crafty designs which they had devised in secret might be revealed. For then would be made manifest both the chastity of Susanna and the incontinence of the elders, and in this way women might find, through the fortitude of Susanna, a house of instruction and that which is good. And moreover, the contending in which she was engaged was very great. And it increased in violence and became a mighty fight. Now the matter was far more difficult for Susanna than it was for Joseph. For Joseph was a man, and he was contending against one woman only. But this woman, Susanna, had to contend against two men, who were strong in their endeavor to do evil. And it is a matter whereat to marvel that she contended against these men in a garden, the place wherein the serpent succeeded in leading Eve astray. Now this spectacle was both great and profitable. It was a great spectacle because the elders who stated that they were nobles among the people were those who were contending in the strife. And it was a profitable spectacle also because the chastity of one weak woman was able to fight successfully against these nobles, even after they arranged with each other to fight against her together. And now the heavens are open, the trumpets send forth their blast, the contest is prepared, and the true master of the contest watcheth from heaven, and the multitudes of the angels gaze out from the heights of heaven on the spectacle. The serpent worketh diligently in these sinful elders, but faith herself is strong to prevail in this chaste woman, and there is great anxiety among them on both sides. The elders are afraid lest a woman vanquish them, while Susanna herself is afraid lest she fall from her state of chastity. 
and the devils make ready their rich banquet for these sinful men, and the angels prepare the honor which they have to bestow on Susanna from heaven. And these lawless men laid hold upon Susanna, and they strove with her first of all, in words saying, We are elders among the people. We are they to whom the people have entrusted the law, and the power to unbind and to bind in every matter whatsoever. There is no one at all in this place to see us. Be persuaded and lie with us, for we desire thee eagerly. If thou wilt not be persuaded to lie with us, we will bear false witness against thee, and declare that there was a young man with thee, and that it was on account of him thou hast sent away thy servants. Observe now how exceedingly difficult were the circumstances in which Susanna, this woman who was all alone, was involved. There were the disgrace of an act of unchastity, and the penalty of death, wherewith she would be threatened, and the contemptuous opinion of the people, which would make all of them to scoff at her, and the hatred wherewith her husband and her kinsfolk would hate her, and the grief of all her neighbors, and of every member of her household. And finally, there was the destruction of all her house. But none of these thoughts overcame this chaste woman, for both her hope and her heart were strong in the God of heaven. Then Susanna sighed heavily and said, I am surrounded by tribulation on every side. If I do this thing, I shall suffer death, and if I do not do it, I shall not be able to escape from your hands. But it is preferable not to do this thing, and to fall into your hands, rather than to commit sin before God. Woe is me, the shepherds whom I have considered to be men, who would direct and guide me, I now see are wolves round about me. And those whom I have regarded as a haven, wherein the ship of my soul might take refuge, are those who would wreck me, and they are far more dangerous for me than a mighty storm. Think not that I am afraid of you, and that I shall be persuaded by you to do your will, and that I shall pollute my chastity. I will not disgrace my parents. I will not cause my noble birth to be held in derision. I will not give my husband occasion to grieve. I will not put an end to my lawful intercourse with my husband for the sake of an improper union with you. I will not hearken to your senseless words and I choose to die by a violent death rather than accept a polluted couch. Though my husband be not here with me in body, yet he is here in the desire of my heart, and the faces of my parents are with me at all times. Besides this, have ye in fear God, who is looking at you. Take shame to yourselves before the angels who are round about us by night and by day. Know ye yourselves, and know who ye are, Know ye also the law which ye read. For the law saith, Ye shall not lust to know the wife of thy neighbor. And having said these words, she cried out, wishing to make witnesses come so that they might testify concerning their lawless behavior. And the elders also cried out. And behold, the servants of Susanna and her handmaids rushed into the garden, and they saw the elders reviling her. And when the elders had uttered their charges against her, the servants were exceedingly ashamed, for they had never at any time heard words of this kind spoken against Susanna. And it came to pass on the morrow that a very great multitude of people gathered together, for as yet the struggle awaited decision, and the award of the crown had not been given by the judge. And all the people were gathered together into the synagogue, men and women, and young men and maidens. Now the spectacle was very great indeed. Men who were on the earth knew not at all what they were about to see. But those who were in heaven, that is to say the angels, had knowledge of everything which concerned the matter. And the elders came in, being filled with wickedness, and they called unto Susanna, as unto a woman whom they considered to have been already called into disgrace and death. But the true judge considered her to be as a woman who hath already been called into life and unto the glory which is for ever. And the elders said unto the people, Send for Susanna, the daughter of Hilkias. And they sent for her, and Susanna and her parents and all her kinsfolk, and her son came, and Susanna herself came as a woman who hath been held to be worthy of death for the sake of her chastity which was great. 
and she heaved bitter sighs, not because she was about to die, but because she was going to leave behind her bad name to her parents, and all her kinsfolk would become objects of derision unjustly, and because she had not there one who could bear witness concerning the matter which happened to her in the paradise. And there were very many folk who sighed for her, her parents and her friends and acquaintances, and her kinsfolk, and the people of her native town. And her husband wept, and all the members of his house lamented for her. And Susanna, being sorely grieved and afflicted in heart, and suffering bitterly and weeping, and being in a state of abject abasement, came and took her stand in the midst of the whole assembly, and the whole multitude rose up on their feet to see her, both angels and men. And the two elders rose up in their garb of shepherds, being, however, wolves, and the serpent, the calminator, was speaking in them, and they laid their hands upon her. And they said, Yesterday we were walking in the garden by ourselves, and this woman came in with two servants, and she sent the servants away and closed the door of the garden. Then there came into her the young man who hath disappeared, and he had intercourse with her. When we saw the sinful act, now we were hidden in a corner of the garden, we ran to them, but we were not able to lay hold upon the young man, for he was stronger than we were, and he opened the door and fled. Now we laid hold of this woman, and we questioned her, saying, Who is this young man that we see with thee? But she did not wish to tell us, and these things concerning which we bear witness we did actually see. And the whole synagogue believed them, seeing that they were elders and judges of the people, and they condemned Susanna to death and they took her forth to slay her, and there was no one whatsoever to avenge the truth, God alone excepted, who, however, allowed these things to take place, in order that through both sides the work of each might be made manifest and fulfill itself. On the one side wickedness and incontinence and calumny and lawlessness, and on the other the perseverance of Susanna even unto death. And up to what point doth it appear to thee, that God remaineth oblivious of the believing ones. He remaineth unmindful until he hath tried them even as gold is tried in the smelting house. And he searcheth thoroughly the righteous by means of temptations of various kinds. For this is what he did in the case of Abraham, who took Isaac to offer him as a burnt offering. He built an altar, and there was no sheep there. He heaped up wood upon the altar, and there was no ram there. He took the slaughtering knife in his hand, and he went to Isaac to slay him, when straightway by a word God made him to hold his hand. And moreover these things have happened in this wise, so that each one of us, when temptation cometh upon him, and when he draweth nigh unto death, may not despair of the help of God, but may expect it until a length it shall come unto him. Now they took Susanna forth to destroy her, and there was no man about her to help her. And having seen that there was no help whatsoever to be had from men, she fled to the helper who is in heaven, the witness who is faithful, the eye which never sleepeth. And she said, O God, who art forever, who knowest the things which are hidden in the heart, and who knowest everything that shall happen before it take his place. Thou alone art he who knoweth that these elders have borne false witness against me, And behold, I am going to die without having committed any of these offenses concerning which these elders have borne false witness against me. And he who said, Whilst thou yet speakest, I will speak. And behold, I am in this place, heard her. Now whilst they were taking her forth to destroy her, behold, God made the Holy Spirit to move in a certain young man whose name was Daniel. And he cried out with a loud voice, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this woman. And the people turned towards him, and spake unto him, saying, What is the meaning of this word which thou hast spoken? And he took his stand in the midst of them, and said, Be ye not fools as to act in this manner, O house of Israel. Get ye back to the hall of judgment, for these elders have borne false witness against her. And all the people went back in haste. And Daniel said unto them, Separate the two elders from each other, and I will ask them questions. And he said unto each one of them, 
O thou who hast lived a long life in evil days, now have come upon thee thy sins which thou hast committed from the beginning. Tell me now, under what kind of tree was it that thou didst see Susanna and the young man talking together? And he said, Under the Masek tree. And Daniel said unto him, Thou hast directly lied, on thine own head be it. For the angel of God, with the sword in his hand, hath now taken his stand by thee, and he shall cleave thee in twain. And having set this man on one side, he cried out to the other, and he said unto him, O seed of Canaan, and not of Judah, the beauty of the body hath led thee astray, and carnal desire hath stupefied thy heart. Tell me now, under what kind of tree was it, that thou didst see Susanna and the young man talking together? And he said, Under an evergreen oak. Then Daniel said unto him, Thou hast also lied, on thine own head be it. For behold, the angel of the Lord standeth by thee with his sword in his hand, and he shall cleave thee in twain. And all the people cried out with a loud voice, saying, Blessed be the Lord God, who delivered every one that putteth his trust in him. And on that day he delivered innocent blood, and there was fulfilled on Susanna that which David spake, saying, My soul cleaveth to thee, and it is thy right hand which receiveth it. And these two elders, who had hunted after the soul of Susanna, shall descend into the depths of the earth, and shall be delivered over to the sword, and they shall become portions for foxes, that is to say, for the devils. Moreover, the king, that is to say, Susanna, shall rejoice in God, and every one who sweareth by him shall be honored, that is to say, every one who believeth on him. For the mouth which speaketh violence hath been stopped, that is to say, these two wicked elders. Then was the grief of the parents of Susanna turned into gladness, and her husband rejoiced and ascribed glory to God. And all her kinsfolk were glad, and all the people of her village, and all the members of her household rejoiced greatly. In short, there was gladness before God and the angels and men. Seest thou the strength of Susanna's soul? Seest thou the chastity which was in this weak vessel? The soul which is chaste shall endure, and shall conquer in deathlessness. It shall continue to bear fruit which flourisheth and decayeth not, and it shall continue unfailingly in the virtue which is without blemish by the help of God. This woman, moreover, was glorified by men, and was magnified by the angels, and was crowned by God. Imitate, therefore, this woman Susanna, O ye women, and follow her example, in order that ye yourselves may be held worthy of the exceeding great honor that was paid to her by God in Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom be glory for ever and for ever. Amen. End of Homily 2Homily 3 of Coptic Homilies in the Dialect of Upper Egypt by E. A. Wallace Budge. The Sibervox recording is in the public domain. The Discourse of Athanasius, Archbishop of Rakote, on Mercy and Judgment. The world which hath no remembrance of God, O my brethren, is governed by the injustice which appertaineth to cruelty, and by the inhumanity which appertaineth to weakness even as the holy apostle spake, saying, According as God did not think fit to let them remain in a state of rectitude, God gave them over to hard-heartedness and to doing the things which were unseemly. And they worked injustice of every kind, and wickedness and evil and deeds of avarice. And they were filled with calumnies and murder and with contention and the cunningness of the evil heart of the informer and of the talebearer and with the works of the debaucher, which are hateful to God, and with the pride of the babbler of foolish things, and of him that seeketh to find out the things which are evil. And they hearkened not to the words of their parents, and were fools, and men without belief, and were arrogant without mercy. These are they whom God converted to the worship of God, and he teacheth them also to depart from that which is evil, and to have merciful care for him that is his neighbor, according to that which Isaiah taught us, saying, In the character of God, cease ye from the things which are evil. Learn to do 
that which is good. Now the law containeth a very large number of precepts, which do injury to him that is our neighbor. But there are also therein commandments concerning charity, or the love of men, and the doing of deeds of mercy to each other. Now if it happen that a man omitteth to keep one of these precepts, it will not be sufficient for him to put another in its place. Neither will the man be acceptable before God, who doeth good with that which is gained from the profits of injustice, if he give nothing of the things which he himself possesses. Because even the men who do unjust things make the attempt to offer up gifts of their own goods to God. For it is written, The sacrifice of wicked men is an abomination unto God. Therefore concerning him that showeth himself to be without mercy, doth he, i.e. the book, say, Unto him that shutteth his ears, and hearkeneth not unto the poor, God will not hearken when he maketh his appeal to him. Therefore hath the book of Proverbs counseled us, saying, Give thou to God of thy labor in truth, and thou shalt give him the first fruits of thy righteousness. Now supposing that thou didst give a gift to God of a part of something which had been obtained by thee through injustice or plunder, thy gift would not be very acceptable to him, either because thou hast obtained that something by injustice or plunder, or because thou wast giving a portion of it to him as a gift. For thou must bring as thine offering the gift which is pure, even as it is written, the offerings of the upright are acceptable unto him. And moreover, if thou dost acquire possessions through thine honest labor, thou shalt bring unto God offerings from the same, whereon the poor shall feed themselves. Yet they shall be accounted unto you as things plundered, for according to that which he spake by the prophet Malachi, saying, The first fruits and the tithes are stolen by you, and the plunder shall be in your houses. Now it is meet for us to mingle mercy with judgment, and we must acquire the faculty of judging, but we must speak in mercy, according to that which is written, Keep mercy and judgment, and do thou draw nigh unto thy God at all times. For God loveth mercy and judgment. Let him draw nigh unto God, who careth for the poor in mercy. Finally, let each one of us now in this place, i.e. the world, examine himself. Let the rich man consider most carefully concerning the things which he hath gotten, and among which he considereth the gifts of God to be, whether he hath acted justly towards the poor man, or whether he hath taken advantage of his weakness, or whether he hath claimed more than his share of that which belongeth to him, or whether he hath employed force in his dealings with him, instead of righteousness. Now we are commanded in respect of our servants to keep strict justice when dealing with them, and to treat them equitably, because thou hast the power to deal unjustly. Do not practice injustice, and because thou art able to defraud, do not claim more than thy share. On the contrary, because thou hast the works of power, do thou make manifest the works of righteousness, for it is not a matter which is impossible for thee to perform. Thou art obligated to give a proof of the obedience and fear which are in thee in respect of God. But in that wherein thou hast the power to transgress, thou shalt not transgress. Supposing thou didst carry off the tools of certain poor men, and didst give them to other men, thou wouldst be acceptable neither for thy theft nor for thy gift. Why shouldst thou pollute thy riches, and bring upon them works which are unrighteous? Why shouldst thou make thine offering to be an abomination to God, by undertaking to offer up an offering of injustice, because thou thinkest to do a kindness to other poor men with it? Be merciful unto that man who hath suffered injustice. Do deeds of kindness and charity to this man, and act with gracious goodness to that man, that thou shalt thereby perform mercy and judgment. For God doth not make himself a partner in greediness, neither doth he share with thieves and robbers. It is not impossible for him to feed the poor whom he hath committed unto us, but he requireth the fruitfulness of righteousness and the love of men at our hands, whereby we shall be both of use to others and do good to ourselves. Mercy hath no existence in injustice, neither hath blessing any existence in cursing. 
nor doth the doing of acts of kindness spring from the tears of those who weep. For God spake concerning the tears that moved him of those who were treated unjustly, saying, These are the things that ye do which I hate. Ye cover over my altars with tears, and weeping and sighs which arise from sufferings. Acts of this kind performed in this manner are works of vanity, and they are performed for the sake of the approbation of men, and not for the approbation which is from God. It is for this reason that the Lord rightly said, Do not your acts of charity in order that men may see you. For if thou wouldest do thy works of charity, so that it shall be God alone who knoweth thereof, thou wilt guard thyself from doing them in greediness. For thou knowest that thou wilt not please in this manner God, who watches us. Let us perform our acts of charity in such a manner that we may receive the reward, therefore, from God. Now though God giveth his good gifts unto those whom he honoureth, he honoureth in no way whatsoever him that seetheth more than his share. Refrain from making an offering unto God, if thou causest grief to thy brother. For the book saith, If thou goest to offer up an offering upon the altar, thou shalt remember in that place, if thy brother hath any matter against thee. If he hath, go forth first of all, and make thyself to be at peace with thy brother, and then come in and offer up thy gift. Remember then Zacchaeus, the tax-gatherer, who determined to restore to him that had been defrauded his property twofold, and in this way he divided his possessions among the poor. For he knew that he wished to receive Christ unto his house, and that Christ would only receive unto himself those who give gladly unto the poor, and that he would not receive him unless he did away with his averseness and the things which he had acquired unjustly. And in this manner did the Lord receive in integrity Zacchaeus, who said, Salvation is in this my house this day. And these things we would say unto those who do works of charity, but who do not take care to be scrumptiously fair and just. And we would also say them unto him that keepeth strict watch on himself in respect of committing acts of injustice, but is careless in respect of doing works of charity. The tree which beareth not fruit they cut down and cast into the fire. In this manner this tree will never give pleasure to the husbandman, who appertaineth to heaven, who spake, saying, I came seeking for fruit on this fig tree, and I have found none. And he commanded them to cut it down, so that it might not make the ground to be without value also. And they are also wont to condemn him that giveth no pledge to the poor. And there is their act of punishment because of this in the following words. For he saith, He who forgetteth to give a pledge to the poor shall cry out to God, and he will hearken unto him. And God saith, For I am the merciful one. Now it is a terrible thing, and a matter wholly outside the law, for thee to come back and reap thy fields a second time, or for thee to come back and gather grapes a second time from thy vineyard, or for thee to come back and gather fruit a second time from thine olive trees. For it is meet that thou shouldest leave these for the poor. If now these commandments were given unto those who were under the law, what shall we say in respect of these who are under Christ? These are the words which the Lord spake, saying, Except your righteousness exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall not enter into the kingdom which is in the heavens. Therefore we must give not only from our fields, and from that which cometh in to us, but also of the work of our hands. And the apostle taught us that we must give unto those who have nothing at all, for he spake, saying, Ye shall accept the good things, in order that ye may find the wherewithal to give gifts to him that is in need. Unto him that wisheth to follow in the steps of the Saviour will the Lord reveal his divine person, and he will make him to give of all his substance, and to do that which is good to the poor, and in this wise he shall follow in his footsteps. Now those who follow in his footsteps, and those who are perfect, give effect wholly to the great and perfect readiness to give which is in charity. 
he gave them this commandment in order that they should perform service by means of their possessions and should convert the raiment also to the service by the word and the spirit. He gave them this commandment in order to make them do acts of beneficence and to give gifts for the common good and to continue to do so with what they had so that through these things they might find themselves to be like unto the love which God hath for man and might do works of charity and give thanks. For he spake, saying, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Be merciful, and mercy shall be showed unto you. Through the things of this earth, moreover, he promised to them a share in those things which are with him. For these are they who shall take their stand at the right hand of God. And these are they unto whom the king, when he shall come, shall speak, saying, Come ye blessed of my father, and ye shall inherit the kingdom which hath been prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and ye gave me food. I was thirsty, and ye gave me water to drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me to yourselves. I was naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then the righteous, having marveled at these words, shall say, Lord, at what time did we ever do these things unto thee? And he shall say unto them, Amen, I say unto you, inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of these few little ones, it is to me that ye have done these things. For ready kindness shown to the saints is piety shown to Christ, and ready kindness shown towards those who belong to Christ maketh him that showeth it to be a minister of Christ. Not only if he hath many possessions, but also if he hath very few. Whatsoever he hath, this shall he offer. And if a man shall give only a cup of cold water to a disciple, in the name of a disciple, Amen, I say unto you, he shall not lose his reward. And he will give it unto thee, O rich man, the occasion for true liberty. For through these things thou shalt find thyself to be a fellow worker with God. Thou shalt feed with the soldiers of Christ, and thou shalt feed with them at thy will, and thou shalt be constrained in no wise. For the King of heaven neither setteth restraint nor maketh demands upon the perfect. He receiveth to himself those who give willingly, in order that those who give may also receive, and that those who pay honor may themselves be honored, and that those who make themselves partners with the poor in things which are temporal shall be invited to take their share with them in the things which are forever. These things, let us remember, are forever and for all time. And let them be before our eyes, and they shall be in our souls, in order that we may make use of the time and not allow it to escape from us. And we must not forget the things which are. Now let us await after them that which is to come lest through our expectation we thrust the matter behind us, and there come upon us our end. Now the Lord give this unto us that we might find ourselves keeping watch, and we must produce fruit and labor in the remembrance of his commandments, and we must make ourselves ready for his glorious rest, and then nothing whatsoever shall give us offense. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom be the glory, and with him the Father and the Holy Spirit, for all ages. Amen. End of homily 3. Homily 4 of Coptic Homilies in the Dialect of Upper Egypt by E. A. Wallace Budge. The Sleeperbox recording is in the public domain. The Discourse of Our Holy Father, Apa Theophilus, the Archbishop, which he pronounced concerning repentance and continence, and also how a man must not neglect to repent before the last times come upon him. The prophet spake, saying, My tears have been unto me bread by day and by night, and again the heart which is contrite and abased God will not reject. Now therefore, O my brethren, let us afflict our souls with fastings, and let us give our bodies unto death by means of manifold sufferings, until we make ourselves companions of the angel of repentance, in order that he may divert his path from us. The saints delivered their bodies over unto death, until they vanquished that which was opposed to them, 
according to what is written, For thy sake they put us to death all the day long. They accounted us as the sheep for the slaughter. And again the apostle taught us, saying, Put to death that which is in the members which are upon the earth, that is to say, fornication, uncleanness, passion, and evil lust. Now when we deliver ourselves over to misery through fastings and prayers and long nights of vigil, we crucify both our bodies and our souls. Let us apply to ourselves that which the psalmist David spake, saying, Thou hast consumed wickedness of heart. Then the angel of repentance shall come, and he shall root out the plants which are evil, those which the devil has sent into our hearts. And he shall plant in their place the fruits of the Spirit, according to that which the apostle spake, saying, The fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, gentleness of heart, purity, and the others which come after these. Then, O brethren, straightway repentance shall enter quickly into us, and it shall fill all our members, and it shall cleanse us from all our sins, and it shall burn up in us all pride of heart, and all anger, and all wickedness, and everything which is evil, and every remembrance of the evil one, and shall compel the spiritual excellences to come, and to enter quickly into our souls, and it shall plant into each one of them in its proper place. And straightway it shall root out wrath, and plant in its place gentleness of heart, and it shall root out pride of heart, and plant humility in its place. And it shall root out enmity, and plant peace in its place. It shall make hatred to flee from us, and it shall drive it forth out of our hearts, and it shall make peace and love to become a crown upon our heads. It shall carry away from us carelessness and slothfulness, and it shall rouse us up to prayer, and to nights of vigil, and to meditation on the Psalms, and to the singing of spiritual hymns. Consider further, O my brethren, this repentance, and observe what a great abundance of fruit it is wont to produce in the man who repenteth, and how it maketh all the members to shoot forth into blossom, even as the tree which is planted by the waters. O repentance, how great are thy consolations! Thou art the joy which hath its being in grief, and the merriment which hath its being in tears. The fruits of repentance ripen fully in the strength of the Spirit. For even if the man who hath repented holdeth his peace, the fruits of the Spirit are manifest in his face. O repentance, in thy gracious gentleness, and in thy soft speech, and in thy quiet behavior, thou art a rebuke to every man. For thou art that which hath pointed out the way for all the saints, into the fight and into the suffering. Moreover, come ye, O my brethren, and adorn ye repentance with the adornments of your fastings, and anoint her with the sweet unguents of your prayers, and put a crown upon her head with the abasement of your tears, so that if there be any spiritual excellences which do not appear in the beauty of the adornments wherewith ye have adorned her, they shall then be gathered together, and shall come and make merry with those which are already in the soul. Further, when these take up their abode in your hearts, they shall make you to be without sin. Where, moreover, are now the carelessness and heaviness of the body? Where are the disturbing emotions which are in passion, and the profane thought, and everything which is evil? Where are envy and hatred and contentiousness? Where are wrath and wickedness? Where are pride of heart and the words which are cruel? Where are fornications and impurity and adultery? Where are the things of vainglory and the apparel of splendor? Where are luxury and eating and feasting and wine-bibbings and lewd drunkenness? Where are the idle words and the filthy jests? Who is there that would not to be a companion of repentance, and to make himself a stranger unto all these evil things, which blind the eyes of our hearts, so that they are unable to see the marvelous light? For repentance maketh a man to spread out his wings like an eagle, and maketh him to penetrate into the heights of heaven through her spiritual excellences. Now he who hath repented and hath been exercised in endurance, and in hunger, and in thirst, awaiteth eagerly the good things of heaven, which shall continue for ever and ever. Therefore also, O my beloved, let us bring into subjection our bodies by fastings, 
and by prayers and by nights of vigil, in order that we may enjoy his promise of the things which are in the heavens, for according to what he spake, saying, Ye are those who have endured patiently with me in my temptations, and I, even I, will establish with you the kingdom, even as my Father hath established the kingdom with me. And ye shall eat and ye shall drink with me at my table in my kingdom. Moreover, we must understand, O my brethren, how honorable is the condition of repentance, and we must understand the gifts of grace, which she hath given unto us. O repentance, who art the food of those who suffer hunger, and a fountain of waters of life unto those who are athirst. O repentance, who art the consoler of those who are passing their nights in vigil, who adornest them with the fruits of their sufferings. O repentance, whose tears are the pleasure and the sweet perfume of the angels of God. O repentance, who art the helper of those who have given themselves over to despair. Let us consider the fellowship which she made with the men of Nineveh, when she invited them to her in her love for man, and when they made haste to open unto her in great abasement, and in tears and sackcloth. Now it was not only men who put on sackcloth, but also the cattle and sheep, and when the Almighty, the good and merciful, the man-loving God, saw such great fruits as these in the hand of repentance, which she laid down before the throne of mercy, not only did he reverse his sentence of doom, but he also made his word to the prophet Jonah to be a lie, and he did not destroy the city. And now, O my beloved, abandon ye not repentance, for what shall ye find which will adorn you in your sufferings like repentance? Nay, on the contrary, let us give unto her honors in the place of the good things which she hath brought unto us from on high. And moreover, of what kind are the good things which she hath brought unto us from on high? Again, of what kind are the good things which we shall give unto her? They are fastings, and the prayer which is pure, and our hands shall be stretched out in prayer, and our hearts shall be in the height of heaven. Give unto her humility and sighings, through which the angels become the counterparts of men. Give unto her the tears which shall be abundant through the threat of the fire of Gehenna. Give unto her the faith and the hope which make a man draw nigh unto God. Give unto her mercifulness and the love which we must show towards each other and the works of charity which cover entirely a multitude of sins and blot them out at the judgment. Moreover, after all these good things which are thus, let not any of us be deceived and turn a second time to the filthiness of sin after repentance, like a dog which is wont to return to his vomit, wherefore he is held in abomination. Now I call upon you, O my beloved, in order that ye may guard yourselves with exceeding great care, and that ye may not omit to do anything which can benefit our treasures. For our enemy taketh counsel against us at all times, and the thief in his lair is wont to make plots against us at all times. This being so, O my beloved, and as the Comforter and the Spirit are looking upon us with merciful kindness, let us give our tears to God each and every day, in order that they may act for us as messengers before our faces, before we depart from the body. Let us repent as much as we are able, and the saints shall be fellow petitioners with us in our supplications. Let us not restrain ourselves, but let us seek after repentance and fail not to find her. Let us not permit ourselves to fall into tribulation, for he will not hearken unto us in that other world. Let us not allow ourselves to come into the hands of those who are without mercy, whereby we shall endure sufferings, for even if we cry out, they will not hearken unto us. Let us not allow them to cast us into Gehenna. Let us follow after repentance in this world, for there is no repentance in that other world and the avenging angels shall answer and say unto us in anger and with threatenings, Wherefore do ye cry out for nothing? This is not the place in which to cry out. And they shall chide us for the offenses which we have committed, and they will rebuke us because of the things to which we have listened. And the saints in despair will make complaint to God concerning us, saying, We endured and we cried out until our throats could cry no longer. 
Straightway in that hour the angels of wrath, who are set over the punishments, shall bind in chains the souls of the saints, and shall cast them into the Tartaros of Amente, and shall inflict upon them their punishments to their utmost strength. And if we suffer pain and weep there, who will hearken unto us? Or who will show compassion upon us in that other world? Or who will take our tears from us and carry them to the place of compassion? Or who among the saints is there that will make entreaty before God on account of our tribulation and the necessity wherein we shall find ourselves, supposing that we die before we have repented of our sins? The things which we have left undone in this world, whilst we were in the body, where shall we find them? to give us help in that other world. Neither gold nor silver nor vineyards nor any possession shall afford us help in that other world. Neither shall the Father have the power to seek out his Son in that other world. Nor shall the mother have the power to seek out her daughter. Nor shall a son have the power to give help to his parents. Nor shall a brother have the power to give help to his brother. No one of these shall become the redeemer of our miserable souls but each man shall himself bear his own burden of punishments, whereto he shall be condemned. And moreover, the Savior proclaimed, saying, Whosoever shall love father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whosoever will not forsake son and daughter and take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. And he shall not inherit the kingdom which is in the heavens. And oh, how awful and terrible a thing it is to fall into the hands of the living God in the hour of our visitation. Now the holy apostle explained unto us these words when he spake, saying, I am indeed a wretched man. Who is he that shall deliver me from the body of this death? O oh, what great terror, O oh, what great tribulation shall come upon all souls in that moment, wherein they shall bring them forth from our members. In that hour the deepest darkness shall enshroud us, and the blackness of the night shall be upon our eyes, and it shall spread itself over all the light, and our hearts shall be disturbed exceedingly by reason of those beings who shall come for us, and by the horror of their forms, which shall benumb us, and by the terrifying aspect of their faces, and by the gnashing of their teeth, and by the wrath of their eyes, and by the quaking of their limbs, and by the stridings of their legs, and by the roarings of their lips, and by all the forms which they have, and by the rushing in upon us, because they wish to devour us. When we see all these things before us, what shall we say, or what word shall we utter, or what shall our mouths declare, and whither shall we flee, or in what place shall we hide ourselves? Now it will be impossible to escape from their hands, and it will be impossible to flee into any place where the face of God is not. For it is written, Whether can I flee from thy face, or whether can I flee from thy mercy? Now therefore, let us know what is the medicine whereby we may cure ourselves of this great sickness, or with what we may cover ourselves during our affliction, which is so exceedingly great. Neither silver nor gold nor possessions nor riches can do so, for none of these things is able to work our healing, and neither the whole world nor what therein is shall be able to render help unto us. And we shall find no medicine which will cure us except prayer and fasting and humility, for it is these which have the power to cover ourselves in the hour of our necessity. Let us keep in remembrance the Lord of all, Jesus, the Son of the living God, who fashioned every being which breatheth, and the heavens and the earth and the sea and the rivers, the Lord of whatsoever is in the heavens, and of whatsoever is on the earth, unto whom alone belongeth power. He hath his being in the Father, and the Father hath his being in him. He cried out, saying, My Father, deliver me from this hour. And again, My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass away from me. Nevertheless, let thy will be done, and not mine. And he prayed until the third time, saying, If this be thy will, let it come to pass. Observe ye and consider these awful words which the Lord of all spake, the Lord who was not afraid of death, for it is he who hath the power over death, and it is he who is the Lord thereof. On the contrary, it is because he is God, and because he liveth 
in the glory which is exalted, that he took the lowly form of man, in order that he might taste death on behalf of all, and it was fitting that he should do so, and that they should deliver him over into the hands of sinners. For this reason he made known unto every one that the necessity for death, which had to come upon every soul of man in the hour of their visitation, was very great. Now that day it shall be of tribulation and of necessity, and of sighing, until we shall have passed by this great danger, which is full of terror. Now if we shall have set repentance to be a fellow worker with us, we shall find it straightway, and we shall proclaim it at the feet of God, the Father of good, who shall deliver us from all these necessities, and from the tribulations which shall come upon us, and it shall lift us out of the hands of these angels, who are our pitiless adversaries. And if we shall have set humility to be a fellow worker with us, it shall never cease to make supplication to God, until he hath scattered these adversaries, and hath taken us in gladness into the bosom of the saints in the country of the living. And if we shall have set love to be a fellow worker with us, it shall never cease to cry out to the merciful one, the father of compassion, until he hath driven these adversaries from us and hath taken us with gladness into the glorious sanctuary of Jerusalem of heaven, and hath given us as gifts to the Beloved One. If, however, we have none of these things with us as fellow workers, then know ye that when we are in torture, and cry out under the punishments, and weep in misery, no mercy of any sort whatsoever shall be to us. On the contrary, the avenging angels shall be wroth against us, and they shall revile us mercilessly, and they shall inflict most just punishments upon us. Moreover, in that other world, there shall be no mercy wherewith to show compassion to souls, but the appointed work of those pitiless adversaries shall be to inflict torments on the souls of sinners. But what a terrible thing it will be to fall into a place wherefrom there is no delivery, even as it is written, He who feareth not shall be in the places which he deserveth for ever, and he shall never be delivered therefrom. Oh, what a wretched state! And in what manner will ye take your stand, O ye who have borne the sacred names of priests and monks, and have nevertheless treated with contempt the commandments of God? The sinners who shall be enduring punishment there shall revile you, and shall say unto you, It was necessary for us to commit sin, because we were involved in the cares of the business of life, and we were led astray through the error of the matter of our bodies. But as for you, what do ye do in this place? And why are ye suffering these punishments, which are endless? Are ye not those who wore the garb of piety, i.e. of the ascetic life in the world? Oh, how great shall be the disgrace in that world! For to it no end hath been assigned, and it shall continue for ever. O oh, my beloved, God forbid that this great state of misery shall come upon us, but let us strive against it with all our might, in order that we may obtain for ourselves the great glory which is in that other world, wherein all the saints are arrayed. Pray, O my brethren, that we may attain unto this glory, for it is the glory which endureth for ever. Let us repent then, O my beloved, and, O my brethren, let us weep at all times, before the Savior, until his voice come to us in joy, saying, Your sins are forgiven you. For the shedding of tears of repentance maketh the compassion of God to have regard unto thee, and to show mercy unto thee. The shedding of tears of repentance maketh the Holy Spirit to enter quickly into a man, and to take up his abode in him. By the shedding of tears of repentance, God maketh thee to become a new creature a second time, and he bringeth back to thee the fruit of thy health-giving suffering. For the shedding of tears taketh not place without the turning of the heart, and the turning of the heart doth not take place in those who pass their lives in lewdness and jesting. Neither doth repentance flourish in the man who is sated with sluggishness. But through the suffering of fasting and the vexing of the flesh, thy heart shall be in a state of humility, and thou shalt seek after repentance, and thou wilt sigh by reason of thy sins. And now, O my beloved, let us take the greatest care of our lives at all times, so that we may make supplication, and that through God we may become faithful. 
See how very many sufferings our Lord and Savior Christ endured on our behalf. For what evil did he do? And who in all creation is there who shall rebuke him for sin? Nay, he endured all these sufferings on behalf of us sinners, in order that he might bestow upon us this great salvation of repentance. Let the eyes of our heart contemplate the nails which were driven through his holy hands, and his hanging upon the wood of the cross for our sins, and on his side which they pierced with a spear, and there flowed forth blood and water, and the reed wherewith they smote him on his head, and the shameless servant who spat on his face, and he was silent. And when he was athirst on the cross, they had no compassion upon him, but they gave him to drink vinegar mixed with gall in his thirst. In fulfilling all these things, he bore himself in patience and in love to man, for he wished to make us partakers with him in his sufferings, in order that we might inherit with him the kingdom which is in the heavens. And he spake, saying, He who loveth me, let him deny himself and take up his cross, and follow me. And moreover, the apostle Paul himself knew the honor of the cross, and therefore he cried out, saying, Let it not be to me that I should boast myself except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, wherein the world is crucified unto me, and I myself also am crucified unto the world. And again he spake, saying, I myself am crucified with Christ, but I do not live, for it is Christ who liveth in me. And again, without sufferings a man is not able to please God. And again, if it be that we receive sufferings with him, then we shall reign with him. Therefore also, my beloved, let us be prudent and let us watch, for our adversary the devil goeth about roaring like the lions, seeking to devour our souls, and wishing to make us strangers to these great good things. Blessed then are those who shall resist him firmly in the faith, for they are those who shall receive glory with Jesus, according to that which he said, Ye are those who have endured patiently with me in my temptations, and I will establish you in the kingdom, even as my Father has established me in the kingdom. Ye shall eat and ye shall drink with me at my table in the kingdom. Blessed is he who hath endured sufferings and fastings and in prayers, and in nights of vigil and in sighs. For Christ shall magnify him, and he shall eat and shall drink at the feasts of the saints with openness of face. Blessed is he who has showed himself to be a compassionate man, and a lover of his neighbor in the love of God. For he shall enjoy consolation in the bosom of Abraham, in the kingdom which is in the heavens. Blessed is he who is soaked with tears, which he has shed for his sins that he hath committed. For he shall escape the place of weeping and the gnashing of teeth. Blessed is he who hath sorrowed for his sins, for he shall rejoice with God and his angels in the kingdom of light. Blessed is he that hath given his bread to him that was unhungered, for he shall be filled full of the bread of life in the heavens. Blessed is he who hath clothed him that is naked, for his sin shall be covered on the day of judgment. Blessed is he who hath shown mercy to the poor, for mercy shall be shown unto him, and he shall be held worthy to hear these gladsome and joyful words. Come ye who are blessed of my Father, and ye shall inherit the kingdom which they have prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And again he saith, Whosoever shall give one of these little ones a cup of cold water to drink, Amen, I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. Blessed is he who shall forgive his neighbor when he sinneth against him. For if he doth, the note of hand which hath been written against him, and the deed of obligation which he hath to every one shall be destroyed. Blessed are those who shall frequent the church, both morning and even daily, and especially at the time of the receiving of the holy mysteries of the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. For by means of these shall a man become united unto the angels who are in the heavens, and he shall see them face to face, and he shall answer them mouth to mouth in their salutation of Alleluia. Therefore, O my beloved, we must not give sleep to our eyes or slumber to our eyelids, either by day or by night, so that we may escape all evil. For the enemy lieth in wait for us, and he cometh against us in a multitude of crafty sins. If he cometh not in carelessness, he will come in ignorance. 
If he cometh not in pride of heart, he will come in wrath. If he cometh not in vainglory, he will come in fornication. If he cometh not in remissness, he will come in hatred. If he cometh not in fornication, he will come in complaining. If he cometh not in theft, he will come in false swearing and robbery. If he cometh not in passions, he will come in evil thoughts. In short, Satan will never cease from us. He layeth a snare for us with error of heart. He leadeth us craftily to a perverted judgment, and he sendeth carelessness within. Now a mente is filled through carelessness. Let us therefore keep in mind, when fighting these battles, the various forms of craft and deceit which the enemy spreadeth out before us. Let us gird on the armor of righteousness, that is to say, prayer and fasting, and purity and peace and love and humility, and charity and love towards each other, and courteous converse with every man in the fear of God. For by means of these we shall be able to do battle against the loose and foolish talk of deceit. Especially let us fear that awful judgment hall of God. Let us cast away from us the works of darkness, and put on the armor of light, in order that we may inherit the habitation of the saints which is in the heavens, and of the sons of the light, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom be glory, and with him the Father and the Holy Spirit, for all ages and forever. Amen. End of homily 4. Homily 5 of Coptic Homilies in the Dialect of Upper Egypt by E. A. Wallace Budge. The Sleepervox recording is in the public domain. The discourse which St. Athanasius, Bishop of Ricote, pronounced concerning the passage in the Gospel of St. Matthew, the kingdom which is in the heavens is like unto a rich man who came out in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. The Lord saith in the Gospel of Matthew, the kingdom which is in the heavens is like unto a certain rich man who came out in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. He made an agreement with the laborers to pay them a stater a day, and he sent them into his vineyard. He came out again at the third hour, and he saw others standing in the market, and they were idle. He said unto these others, Go ye into my vineyard, and wherefore of ye are worthy I will give unto you. And they went in. He came out again at the sixth hour, and again at the ninth hour, and saw other laborers, and he did the same with these. When however he came out again at the eleventh hour, he saw others standing in the market. He said unto them, Wherefore do ye stand in this place, the whole day doing nothing? They said unto him, Because no man hath hired us. He said unto them, Go ye into my vineyard. Now let us inquire carefully, and let us learn what are these kinds of laborers, and what this vineyard is, and who is this master. In the first place, the master in the vineyard is God the Father, who has governed his creatures from the beginning. And moreover, he speaketh with them through the prophet, who hath made known to us that the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are the new and beloved plant. The laborers whom he hired in the beginning are Moses and Aaron, and Jesus the son of Nun. He called unto Moses in the land of Midian, saying, Come thou, get thee down into Egypt, and thou shalt bring out my people from that land. And thou shalt labor in my vineyard, in commandments and decrees and ordinances. And he covenanted with them for a stater. That is, Moses was to have the honorable rank of prophet, and Aaron was to hold the office of high priest over his people and they were to serve him. Those who were hired at the third hour were the judges whom he appointed to be over his people. Him of whom ye are worthy will I give unto you. They are not prophets, and they were not apostles, but they were those who were worthy of the title of judge. Those who were hired at the sixth hour and at the ninth hour were Samuel and David and all the other prophets. Samuel worked in the vineyard with a horn, David transplanted a slip of the vine from the land of Egypt, and he cultivated it with the psaltery. Hosea found Israel to be like a vine in the desert in some respects, for he said, Israel is a branch of a vine which is good, and his fruit is abundant. Those who were hired at the eleventh hour were the apostles, whom he found to be idle the whole day. 
and they were idle in respect of the works of iniquity of all kinds, because no one had hired them, and the devil could not hire them for the service of idols. He could not hire John the Baptist for the peddlers in the place of eating and drinking. Peter he could not hire for the service of unbelief. Andrew he could not hire in polluted marriage, and he could not make him to become a servant of a woman. For this reason he was called Boanerges, that is to say, son of the thunder of heaven. Therefore could no one hire them on earth to make them to work for him and to give them wages according to what they were worth. Therefore were their wages abundant in the heavens. Therefore doth the Savior say concerning all the apostles, O my Father, the men whom thou hast given unto me from the world have I found to be chosen vessels. And again, of those whom thou hast given unto me have I lost none. And no man is able to come unto me except through my Father, who hath sent me to draw him. Behold, these words make us to know that it is the Father who hireth the laborers for his vineyard. Who is this governor? I say it is the Lord Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God, in whose hand are all the possessions of God, which is a mystery. His power is in Israel and in the other nations, for he himself said, The Father loveth the Son, and hath given everything into his hand. The Son saith, To him belongeth the inheritance. The governor saith, It is he who giveth wages unto those who labor, and the whole world is under his rule. Therefore is the key of David in his hand, and he is the vine. Therefore it is he who rejoiceth in all his creatures. He is the bread. Therefore it is he who giveth meat and drink to all his creation. Now when the evening had come, the Lord of the vineyard said unto his steward, Call the laborers, give them their wages, begin with the last, and continue until thou comest to the first. Give unto each his stater. The father saith unto the son, Either at the last day or today, thou knowest best call the laborers and give them their wages. All the laborers who have labored for the race of men, give them the wages of their work. Paul saith, Now certain men placed in the church, the first being the apostles, unto whom he began to give their wages, and the second were the prophets, etc. The first laborers came, thinking that they would receive more than the others. Hearken unto him, for he said, I say unto you, very many of the prophets and kings have desired eagerly to see which ye see, and have not seen them. The stater which he gave unto them was the honor of apostleship and the holy offering. And the scripture saith, When they had taken the stater, they murmured against the Lord of the vineyard, and said, Why is it? These last have only labored for one hour, and yet thou hast paid them the same amount as thou hast paid us. Now who are these who murmured, and were envious of the laborers who came in last, except the scribes and Pharisees, who had themselves been sent to labor in the vineyard? It is against these that Scripture crieth out, saying, Why have ye burned up my vineyard? And why are the possessions plundered from the poor in your houses? For they themselves received the law as the commands of the angels. But they did not keep it, and they murmured against the Lord, saying, The disciples of John and the disciples of Pharisees fast, but thy disciples do not fast. Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? They wash not their hands when they eat their bread. They eat, they drink, they make merry. Even the apostles cut down the ears of corn, and eat before thy very face and they wander about at large in the world. It was these very men that murmured, saying, Why have thy disciples made the Sabbath to be none effect, who were envious of these last who were the laborers in truth? And the Lord of the vineyard made answer, and said unto one of them, Friend, I have done thee no injustice. Did I not agree with thee for one stater? Take what is thine and depart. And who was it who made all these complaints? I say that it was none other than he unto it was said, Friend, what wherefore thou hast come do? That is to say, it was Judas, who betrayed the Savior, and who spake with great murmurings, saying, Why did they not sell the ungent for three hundred staters, and give them to the poor? If thou didst care for the poor, O betrayer, 
Why didst thou steal their property from the coffer of the treasury? Or was thine eye evil, because I am good? Now because he was a wicked man, he stole the money which was cast into the coffer. And the Savior himself was good to him, and showed him long suffering in respect of him. For he said unto him, I have not the power to do that which I wish with the offerings which they bring. This was God's defense of him. I, who am God, have not the power to pay more wages than those which a man shall earn. And I judge those who shall work wickedness. These are the testimonies and the murmurings of Judas. He murmured with his tongue, and he was cruel and merciless in his heart. He was a wicked man in his soul. He was a thief with his hands, and he was shameless in respect of his eyes. And when they were eating, the apostles watched that they might not let their hands touch those of the Savior in the bowl. For they were afraid and said, Who are we that we should eat with God? But Judas, the man with no right perception, did not hesitate to put his hand into the bowl with the Savior, and he was eager to dip his piece of bread at the same time, and to eat before the Savior. The Savior said nothing in order that we might understand. When the disciples had asked him, Who then is it that shall betray thee? He gave them a sign of the want of right perception in Judas, saying, He who shall dip his hand with me into the bowl first is he who shall betray me. And he said unto him, That which thou do, do quickly. For the Savior made haste to work out the salvation of his creation on the cross, according to the wish and commandment of his Father. Thou wilt not find that he put out of the way, or was careless about that for which he had come, or that he was afraid of death. But he made manifest his readiness for the cross, like a valiant martyr, and like God who is without fear. Therefore did he urge Judas onward, saying, That which thou shalt do, do quickly. Haste thee onward, for all these created beings are hindered. They await thee, and moreover they await me. Those beings who are in the heavens await me, and those beings who are in the abyss and chaos await thee. My Father is with me, and he will help me. The devil is with me, and he standeth by thy side on the right hand of thee, and he will help thee. Those who are in the gates which are in the heavens, that is, the holy angels, will crown me, and the avenging powers are making a menti ready for thee. And he urged him onwards with these words, Haste thee, for I am ready for the whips. Rightly therefore did Ezra say, The creature may not make haste more than the creator. Now since Judas was he who should betray him, Why did he cry out to him, Friend, I do thee no injustice? Though he said to him, Thine eye is evil, but I myself am good. The Savior did not withhold the speech of friendship from him until the hour in which he betrayed him. He called him friend, but he thought of enmity. He gave him the bag that held the money, and he became a thief. He chose him as a disciple, but he meditated guile. He chose him as a man, but he became a devil. O Judas, what is it thou doest? And what didst thou gain when thou didst betray the Lord? Thou didst waste thy life, and didst lose this great honor, the glory of apostleship, for who is above his lot? After the appellation of angel cometh the title of apostle. Now a man hardly considereth his son to be worthy to eat with him, yet it was a helpless servant who made to eat with his God, and Jesus our Lord considered him to be worthy to do so. He ate with the tax gatherers, and he drank with Judas, the lawless man, and a pestilent man reached out his hand with that of God. This wretched man lost his life and accepted death for himself. He exalted himself above his worth, and he fell down on to the ground according to his worth. Jesus chose him with the apostles, and he lost his apostleship. He was chosen to be an heir, and he himself abandoned thine inheritance. Now the apostles were the heirs of the Savior, and they were the light of the world, but Judas did not wish to give forth light. They were the salt of the earth, but Judas did not wish to purge away what was polluted. They were those whom God set in the church, but Judas did not wish to continue with them. Therefore was he removed from the measure of manhood, and he became the portion of the devil. Woe be unto thee, O Judas! 
In what didst thou benefit thyself? Better Cain who killed a man than Judas who killed God. Better Saul who hated a man than Judas who hated God. Better the hard-heartedness of Pharaoh towards the people than the hard-heartedness of Judas towards God. Better the deceit of Balaam than the wickedness of Judas. Better the rebellious speech of Korah in the desert than the stiff-neckedness of Judas in Jerusalem. Better Achan who stole the accursed thing than Judas who stole the gifts of charity. Better the arrogance of Absalom in respect of David than the contumacy of Judas in respect of God. Better the evil counsel to David of Ahithiel, who hanged himself and died, than the condemnation of Judas, who hanged himself and is in Tartarus against the Savior. Better by far the cursings of Shimei, of David, than the scorn of the Savior by Judas. Of far less evil was the bloody murder by Joab, which he committed in sheer wickedness, than the murder by Judas, which he committed in pitilessness. Better the love of money by Gehaz, who became a leper, than the avariciousness of Judas, who went to destruction. The sin of Jeroboam was less than the wickedness of Judas, for Jeroboam only made false gods, but Judas rejected the true God. Friend, I do thee no injustice. Take that which is thine and depart. O evil friend Judas, it was not the Savior who did thee an injustice, but thou thyself, Take thou thy curse, and depart thou into Amente. Now Judas, being in this state, Matthias entered in and received the blessing, and became a disciple of the Master in his stead. He became an apostle, he preached, and he sent forth light into the countries round about. He made himself salt and purified souls. He made himself a servant, and was in subjection unto God. He became a beloved son of the Lord Jesus Christ, and king of all the Lord of all, the glory of all, who ruleth all, who shall judge all, who shows compassion upon all, who does acts of mercy to all, who sustaineth all, who destroyeth all, who transformeth all, who maketh all new, who maketh all glad, and through whom all endured. And now, O man, come and embark in the ship of salvation, which is the faith of the church. It hath two steering oars, wherewith it is guided, And these are the testaments, whereon, if thou shalt meditate, they will bring thee unto a good place for tying up thy boat. It hath a mast, which is the cross of the Lord, and a rudder. These are thy hands, which are stretched out in prayer to God. It hath a sail, which beareth it onwards, that is the power of God, which directeth thee unto every good course. It hath a guiding pole, which is the bishop of the church. It hath a helmsman to steer it who is Jesus, who directed the course of the universe. The sailors on board are the clergy who are in the church and who minister. There is a cargo borne upon it, and these are the Christian people. Thou shalt arrive in port, in a haven which is fair, that is to say, the harbor of Jesus, which is the heavenly Jerusalem. Thou shalt inherit the things promised by God, that is to say, his good things, and thou shalt rest thyself with thy fellow citizens, who are the angels and all the saints. And now behold, O my brethren, we have passed the whole day in exercising ourselves in the word, so that we might at length set the matter whereunto we put our hands upon its feet. And now let us give thanks unto God and unto the Holy Spirit, who hath opened for us our mouth in speech, and hath put into our mouth the words, in order that we may say the things which the Logos has bestowed upon us, which will benefit greatly our own souls, and the souls of those who hear us. Let us ascribe blessing to the Logos, who has blessed us with the Holy Spirit. It is he, moreover, who spake, saying, When they speak with you, take no thought as to what ye shall say, for it shall be given unto you in that hour what ye shall say. For it shall not be you who shall speak, but the Spirit of our Father who shall speak in you. And now let us ascribe glory to God, God Almighty, who has sent unto us the King, the Christ, through whom we bless and praise the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the consubstantial trinity from all ages to all ages. Amen. End of homily 5. Homily 6 of Coptic Homilies in the Dialect of Upper Egypt 
by E. A. Wallace Budge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Likewise, a homily pronounced by Proclus, Bishop of Cyzicus, in the Church of Anathemus in Constantinople, on the Sunday before Easter, when he was installed in the archiepiscopal seat, and Nestorius the heretic was present. May the precious miracle of our Savior overcome our halting speech, and may the utterance of words of great weight vanquish our tongue this day in respect of this miracle. For otherwise we shall not attain to the capacity for preaching, according to its true value, the goodness of him whom they crucified for our sakes. For what is there which hath ever happened that is like unto that which we now see by faith? Moreover, what mind hath ever existed which hath been able to think it out as it really is? Or what understanding hath ever been able to reason it out? Or what heart hath ever been able to depict it to itself? Or what power of speech hath ever described it? Or what eye hath ever seen it? Or what ear hath ever heard the report of such a miracle as this? And of such love, that is to say, of Christ who took upon himself flesh and very truth, and bestowed upon us the blessings of life. Never before did the sun look upon one hanging on the wood of the cross, who was so shamefully slandered as he was for our sakes. Never before did the sun see anyone purchasing our nature under a curse. Never before was the redemption of the world sold for thirty pieces of silver. Never before did there exist passion and death, which were without sin, in the smelting furnace of sin. Never before was one who was out a father, according to the flesh, condemned to death by the governor. Never before was there one who hung upon the tree to draw everyone to him, and to give life unto them. Never before did the tomb receive into it a dead body which had plundered death. Never before did the heavens become dark as night at midday, as they did through him, in order that they might not see the tragedy which they dared to act in respect of God, for they presumed to touch his flesh. Never before did Amante quake as it did when it swallowed him up. Never before was the earth made beautiful by a sepulchre which contained life. It was, however, no sepulchre, but rather a bridal bed. He whom they buried within did not suffer corruption. On the contrary, he who went down into it became a bridegroom. Never before hath any natural man passed three days and three nights in the earth, and risen up therefrom, except him whom of himself fashioned the temple of his body in the womb of the virgin, according to that which he knew. He it was who rose on the third day. He raised up the temple, he lifted it up, by his will through death, and he made manifest the resurrection through the birth pangs of the virgin. Now in this place, i.e. the world, time followeth after begetting, but in this place he who prevaileth is he who preacheth at all times in haste. No lamb which could have been offered up on the altar could ever have carried away the sins of the world, except at that time when God took the form of a servant, and he fashioned an ineffable body for himself, and he clothed himself therewith. Now this was his flesh, the life. The blood is the redemption, the spirit is the seal. The nature of God is without beginning. Well, therefore, hath the blessed Paul said, Old things have departed. Behold, new things exist. The new heaven, that is to say, he who hath come down from it, i.e. heaven, hath blessed our coming thereto. The new earth, he who was laid in a manger, he purified it through the flesh wherein he was placed. The new sea, which is vast and deep, the feet of men of flesh do not pass over it, neither is it contaminated by sin. The new life, this is he who hath made war to cease from him, and the life is full and made perfect in peace. The new humanity, this is that which hath washed itself and cleansed itself in water, and hath smelted itself a second time in the furnace of the Holy Spirit. The new worship, this is not the Savior of sacrifice a second time, neither is it circumcision, but it is the worshiping by faith, 
and the glorifying of one substance in three persons. These things are they which the prophet preached unto us, saying, In that day God shall make himself manifest in counsel and in glory upon the earth. In what day? Declare thou unto us, O prophet. He saith, In that day wherein God, who is over all nature, shall take upon himself flesh of a woman, according to that which he knoweth. The virgin shall bring forth by an ineffable mystery, without a husband, a man, and a lover of men, who shall not change. He will make death to vomit me forth, his death which hath swallowed me up, which I know not. His tomb shall be the treasury of the resurrection, and the captivity of man. He will make to be the mother of freedom. And why should I multiply words? Passion belongeth to my flesh, but power belongeth to divinity. But declare unto us, O thou prophet, in what manner shall God make himself manifest on the earth? Will it be without his manhood? Will it be without his flesh? Get ye hence, O heretic, and speak not of this, for I will not declare the matter unto thee, saith the prophet. If God were to appear without this, I speak of the flesh, O thou new and vain dogmatizer, neither thy face nor thine eye would be able to bear his light, and creation could not clothe herself with her covering of nature. The mighty devil would not be able to go against him to fight with him, for he would quake before the creator. Death would not dare to swallow up the indestructible nature of God, and Amente would be an abject terror of God if he were naked in respect of the flesh. The seraphim would not be able to gaze upon him, and how would it be possible for Amente not to quake? Now the nature of God had need of a hood, not in order to clothe itself, I speak of the indestructible nature of his divinity, but in order that we might not be struck dumb at the sight of him. It was not a covering like unto that of Moses, for that was a covering of the darkness which was ignorance. It was not a curtain which was made by cunning weavers, for its beauty was not due to a mixture of many colors. It was not like unto the covering of the mercy seat, which was interwoven with gold, for its beauty was not derived from the material substance. It was not the work of the cherubim, neither was it wrought by the hand of man, for the cunning handiwork thereof was marvelous. Now the sheep hath need of a covering, in order that it may be guarded by it from the wolf which eateth man. Now the new Jew hath also attacked my words, and hath scoffed at the words of great import of the prophet, and hath contended against the Holy Spirit. And what doth he say? He saith, I do not believe that God appeared upon the earth, or that he who hath no form hath taken shape in the similitude of a man. But if thou deridest the law, O Jew, and if thou wilt not hearken to the prophets, and if thou wilt treat with contumely the evangelists, and if thou wilt pervert the words of the apostles, let us then inquire of the elements, and let us learn from them what they have to confess concerning God who died in the flesh, and who he is. Come now, first of all let us inquire of the Son. Tell us, O Son, for what reason didst thou withdraw to thyself thy rays when the Lord was crucified? Why was it? Was it because he whom they crucified was an ordinary man? If this be so, thou shouldest have done the same when they slew Abel, the righteous man. I will also inquire of heaven. Tell me, O heaven, for what reason didst thou clothe thyself with darkness at the hour of noon? Was it because the Jews pierced the side of the Lord? Or was it because he whom they crucified for us was an ordinary man? If he was, why didst thou not understand, and do the same when they stoned Naboth the Israelite? I will also inquire of the earth. Tell us, O earth, for what reason didst thou quake, when these fighters against God committed this abominable deed of presumption? Was it because he whom they crucified was an ordinary man? If he was, why didst thou not quake when they sawed Isaiah asunder by the command of Manasseh? Let us inquire also of the temple. Tell us, O temple, for what reason was the veil of the temple rent in twain when they crucified Christ? 
Was it because he whom they crucified was an ordinary man? If he was, why wast thou brought to the ground when they poured out in the midst of thee the blood of Zacharias? And now all creation, which is without speech, maketh its defense before us, and saith, Did we not proclaim our grief for the Creator, who was not a fellow servant with us, who had been condemned to death? Nay, but we were sorely moved, and we trembled with fear at the dishonor which was shown to God. For heaven cried out, saying, He whom they crucified in the flesh is God, who took upon himself flesh. This I know for a certainty, for heaven saith, I am the heaven which he bowed, and he came down. The Son cried out, saying, It is my Lord, the Jesus whom they have crucified in the flesh. I, even I, was afraid of the splendor of his divinity, and I withdrew into myself my rays of light. The earth also cried out, saying, The Creator who hath taken upon himself flesh is he whom they have crucified in the flesh. It saith also, Now though I took his flesh into my bosom, when he was in the manger, I could not include within my dominion his divinity. The sea cried out, saying, He whom they have crucified in the flesh is not my fellow servant. The footsteps of my fellow servant Peter did indeed press upon my back, but the feet of my Lord made pure my nature. The temple cried out, saying, He whom they worshipped in me from the beginning is he whom they have treated with contumely in the flesh. Because I was unable to bear so great and so presumptuous a deed, I rent my raiment. Amente cried out, saying, It was not an ordinary man who came down to my domain. For it saith, I know what suffering I received. He whom I took in as a captive, I found to be one who was stronger than everything else, i.e. the Almighty. But if thou wilt not believe the elements, let us then inquire of the powers which are in the heavens. Tell us, O ye angels and archangels, and all ye hosts which are in the heavens, who is he who appeared on the earth? Who is he whom they crucified in the flesh? And they all make answer and cry out with the prophet David, The Lord of might, he is the King of glory, unto whom belong the glory and the power for all ages. Amen. End of homily 6. Homily 7 of Coptic Homilies in the Dialect of Upper Egypt by E. A. Wallace Budge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The homily which Proculus, the Bishop of Cyzicus, pronounced in the great church of Constantinople when Nestorius the heretic was present, concerning his contemptible dogma, on the Sunday which preceded the holy forty days. Very great are the riches of the nourishment of the wisdom of the grace of God. Numberless are the benefits of this gathering together of spiritual beings. Honorable is the merchandise of the market of the church. Joyful is the festival before the altar. Exceedingly splendid is the profit of the traffic with the Savior. Indescribable are the ungrudged riches of the nails of the Savior. Great is the treasure of the gifts which appertain to the beings of heaven. This love knoweth not poverty, for it is Christ who giveth this charity. And if thou wishest, O beloved, and wilt look into the holy scriptures, thou shalt have knowledge of the riches which are immeasurable, and shalt understand that he giveth great gifts, for he wisheth to make thee to know this with careful exactness, and the forms and ways in which he doth this are various. For from the beginning our Lord Jesus Christ hath not ceased to do good to the race of man. Having banished the first man, that is to say, Adam, to the place of one who hath been condemned to punishment, he took him and seated him with him upon the throne in the heavens. He saw Abel when they slew him for a sacrifice, and after his death they made himself the accuser of his murderer in converse with him. He saw Noah being punished by the waters of the flood, and he protected him like a star among the race of men. He found Abraham when he was a sojourner in a strange land, and he made him the father of all nations. 
he saw Joseph when he was in fetters, and he raised him up to be an image of chastity to the world. He saw Moses, who had fled from Egypt, and he made him to be the guide of a people that was without number. Jesus, the son of Nun, was a spy in the country of Palestine, and he curbed the course of the sun and the moon for him. He took David from a flock of sheep and made him king of his race and the father of the awful mystery. He caused Balaam not to hearken unto the ass, and he made the animal to become a reasoning creature instead of a speechless brute. In order to make it a useful thing, he bestowed reasoning power on the Red Sea. He made the rod of Aaron to shoot forth new blossoms, contrary to its nature. He set up a serpent of brass in the desert, like a physician of marvelous powers. He saw Elijah as he fled, and took him up and made him an inhabitant of heaven. He made the flame of the furnace, which was in Babylon, become cool for three children. He made the lions, which were in the pit, become like ready disciples of Daniel. He made the belly of the whale in the sea to become like the bridal bed of the prophet. He made the brothel of Rahab to be changed into an orderly hospital for the reception of strangers. My tongue, however, will not suffice for the narration of all his works of goodness, for the wealth of his working power overcometh my tongue. Now the festival of the church is full of benefits for every kind of salvation. According to that which is written, every good gift and every perfect gift are from heaven, and they come down through the Father of light. In this world he giveth those which are on the earth, and those which are in the heavens. In this world he is the maker of sufferings, i.e. vices, and he maketh men to acquire virtues. In this world the offering is made with material possessions, and the marketplace is quiet. I speak of the church. In this world the clouds give rain through the waters of the gospel. In this world there are trumpets of the apostles, and the preaching of the Trinity uncreate. In this world spiritual hymns fight against the tyranny of the passions, which exist in our intellectual members. In this world Adam is naked on the earth, and we clothe ourselves in the light which is from heaven, our Lord Jesus Christ. In this world we overthrow the ancient tyrant, and we adore the mystery which is of the Virgin. In this world the note of hand of our sins is torn up, and a contract of freedom is delivered unto us. In this world passion is killed, and our soul is made to live again. O thou festival, the place of which is upon the earth, and the benefit of which is in heaven. In this world we are preached with a loud voice, the useful medicines of the fast of the holy forty days, and the great reward of continence, and the angelic character of virginity, and the almsgiving which is accepted, and the gentle disposition, and the quality of blessing, and the meekness which is without limit, and the long suffering which is like unto that of God and the immeasurable patience which cannot be submerged, and the character of not seeking to pry into faith, and into the uncreatedness of the Trinity, and into the incomprehensibility of the dispensation of the flesh. But if thou dost attempt to inquire deeply into the matter, by means of thy power of reasoning powers, thou wilt find that this glorious miracle is wholly beyond all investigation whatsoever. Now the intellect of man hath not the ability to discover by inquiry by what means God became man, and in what way, who is impassable, and is one, and is, moreover, not of the earth, took form to himself in the flesh, he who hath no beginning. Out of the Father without change is he who hath come into being in the last days, and hath made himself manifest in the Virgin, he who is is uncreate. He who hath come into being is not a phantom, for he is God in truth, and man in truth. He is of like substance with the Father, and he is the same as I am, so far as my birth is concerned, according to that portion of him which is create, with the exception of sins. The nature of God is uncreate, and that nature which he hath taken with me is not false, but is indeed the same. We do not divide the natures into two persons, but the two natures are one person, and proceed from the divinity and manhood of the economy of the Son, 
which maketh them to become one of one with him. As the result of the oneness, which it is impossible to describe, he becometh the only begotten son. The heretics think mad this view, and the Jews break their hearts concerning it, and the heathen cut themselves off from us. The son cannot be separated from the father, and yet he was nourished like men. He took upon himself flesh without change. He took the whole man and was not divided. He, the whole of him, is in heaven, and he, the whole of him, is on the earth, and he, the whole of him, is in every place. For the nature of God cannot be divided. In that wherewith he clothed himself, i.e. the flesh, he endured sufferings patiently, but he freed me from sufferings by means of that flesh which he took upon himself. We call him the Son of God, because he is God the Word in very truth, and because he is wisdom and intelligence, which are inseparable from the Father, according to his nature, even as the two animals which are yoked together and are driven by the charioteer, God and man. For he is the strength of the Father, therefore is he the protector of all things which have come into being. He is the truth, therefore he the distinguishing mark of the Father. He is the image of him, therefore is he the same substance, and he it is whom the Father hath begotten without change. He is the light, therefore is he the son of our souls. He is the life, therefore we live in him, and we exist and we move through him. He is justice, therefore he it is who gives unto each and every one according to his merit. He is holiness, therefore he is the slayer of sin. He is salvation, therefore it is he who hath purchased the whole world with his blood. He is the resurrection, therefore it is he who hath set free those who are in the tomb, and hath made them new a second time by his blood. But thou sayest, O Jew, declare unto me other things. I tell thee, O Jew, that I am not ashamed to declare them, with a loud voice, for my salvation is the economy of the Son. For he who existeth of and by himself, and he who himself hath become create, hath himself become create for my sake. And he worked miracles as God, and he bore patiently very many sufferings as a man. That he himself therefore became create was due to his commiseration for me. Because he was a man, he took upon himself flesh and truth, though surely he was the leaven of the bread. For this reason he became a son of man, for in truth he took flesh from a woman without a husband. For he is the way, therefore he is the guide to his father. Next he is the door, therefore he is the guide into paradise. He is the shepherd, therefore he is the seeker after the sheep which is lost. He is the sheep, therefore they slew him on behalf of the whole world. He is the lamb, therefore he is the cleanser of the world from its impurity. For his economy is beyond compare, and his nature is unchangeable. He is the high priest, therefore he offered himself up for us. He is the God who is, in that he was without mother, he was superior to our nature, in that he was without ancestors among us, he appertained not to us in our nature. His generation hath never been recorded in any form, or in any place whatsoever. The inhabitants of heaven cannot utter it, the dwellers upon the earth cannot declare it, and in no place whatsoever can any interpret it. For he took body and soul and mind, in order that through them he might be able to deliver us from death. Be ashamed then, O Jew, because of the sufferings which he endured on thy behalf, and the miracles which he has performed for thy sake. But thou, the new Jew, wilt say, What are the miracles which he has performed? And I, even I, will say unto thee, What are the miracles which he hath performed on your behalf? O ye who strive against God, in comparison with those which he hath performed for us. Which of these miracles is the greater? Which of them make thee to wonder most concerning them? Which is the greater miracle? The heavens raining down bread, or God taking upon himself flesh? 
which is the greater miracle, the sea which became divided, that thou mightest pass through it, or the virgin who ceased not to be a virgin, even after a passage had been made through her, which is the greater miracle, the rod which made the rock to become a lake of water, or the cross which cleansed the world. Be thou ashamed, therefore, at these miracles, O Jew, and do thou worship him who took upon himself flesh. But perhaps thou, O heretic, wilt also say, What are the miracles? O Jew, if thou wishest to know what are the miracles, hearken and I will inform thee concerning them. They are the beginning of the child without seed, the childbirth which was not preceded by the marriage bed in union with man, the virgin who was holy and undefiled, who was both virgin and mother at the same time, and was still a virgin, the course and the disappearance of the star, the hymns of the angels, the fear of the shepherds, the gifts of the magi, the obedience of the sea, the flight of the wind, and its sinking to rest, the walking on the lake, the stilling of the waters, the leaping to the feet of those who were paralyzed, the making of the blind to see, the driving out of the devils, the revivification of those who were dead, the terror-stricken state of created things, the lamentation of heaven, the sun which became dark, the rocks which split asunder, the rending of the veil in the temple, the destruction of Amante, the coming forth from the tombs of those who were dead, the conversion of the thief, the affixing to the cross of the handwriting, and the bill of debt for which we were liable, the overthrow of thy synagogue, the increase of the church, and the growth and the spreading abroad of piety. Finally, when thou hast vomited thine error and thy folly, do thy thyself cry out with the lawgiver Moses, saying, This is my God, I will ascribe glory unto him, for unto him be glory and power, for all ages of ages. Amen. End of homily 7homily 8 of Coptic homilies in the dialect of Upper Egypt by E. A. Wallace Budge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A homily of Appa Basil, Bishop of Caesarea of Cappadocia, which he pronounced concerning the end of the world and the temple of Solomon and the going forth from the body. Let us understand now, O my brethren, that at the moment when God created all things, there was none who knew, neither was there any voice or disturbance, but there existed great quietness and silence when he fashioned the universe. And we hear in the Holy Scriptures concerning the day when the heavens and the earth shall come to an end, and how great the confusion shall be is described therein. And another angel spake, saying, They shall bring about the end of the world, even as we heard. And our Savior made known to us in the Gospels concerning the overthrowings and the tribulations, and the earthquakes which shall take place. For he said, There shall be great tribulations, the like of which hath not been since the beginning, at the creation of the world, and the like of which there shall never be again. And he said also in another place, Heaven and earth shall be convulsed, and the powers which are in the heavens shall be shaken in that day and there shall be great earthquakes, and blasts of the trumpet, and great and frequent flashings of lightning, with mighty thunderings. For the angels shall send forth from his mountain messengers unto the world, and they shall gather together all mankind, and shall make them to stand before the throne of the Son of God, and they shall separate the wicked from among the righteous. Behold now, at the time when he created all things, no one knew except himself and his beloved Son, Jesus Christ, concerning that hour wherein he shall destroy all created things, when everything shall be overthrown, concerning that last hour, I say, and the destruction of the heavens and of the earth, no one whatsoever shall know, not even the angels in the heavens, except himself and his beloved Son, even as we have said before, now it is written that, as no sound was heard at the creation, so in the days in which Solomon was building the temple of God in Jerusalem, there was no sound heard therein, neither the sound of an axe nor that of an iron hammer. 
and during the twenty years in which the king was building his temple in this manner, there was not heard therein even the sound of the artificer who worked in gold. Why was this? First of all, because the temple was being built for God, in whose place of abode no disturbance of any kind must make itself manifest. And secondly, because the wise king, who was building the temple to the Lord God, chose Solomon to continue the building of the temple to him in this manner, that is to say, in quietness, according to the manner in which work on the first creation was performed, which he founded in quietness. And there was no sound, neither was there any disturbance. And thirdly, because God worketh with his own thoughts and with his own intelligence, and he hath therefore no need of a crowd of workmen, who would disturb the place wherein they perform their work. Nay, God is not one who worketh in this manner, but his thoughts and his command are wholly sufficient to make everything which is made. For this reason hearken unto that which is written in the Exodus of Moses. For when Moses had made the tabernacle and the ark of the covenant, God said unto him, Take heed that thou makest everything according to the pattern which hath been shown unto thee on the mountain. Now who was it that made them except the command of God? That is to say, God shall build for himself the temple which is necessary for him. And this also is what the wise man Paul wrote concerning him, saying, You are the temple of God, and the Spirit of God abideth in you. And again he wrote, Know ye not that ye are the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you? And moreover, one of the wise men of old used to say, The great altar of God is the heart of the wise man. The hand and the power of God are the things which made all created things. And moreover, it is they which have made man. Here again what Isaiah saith in the character of God. Is it not my hand which hath established whatsoever is in the earth? And is not my right hand, which hath made firm the heavens? I call them all, and they stand up at one time. And again the blessed man David cried out, saying, It is his hand which hath fashioned the dry land. And again, in the book of Hosea, he saith, It is my hand which hath created the hosts of heaven. And again, in the book of Isaiah, he saith, Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. What kind of house shall ye build for me, saith the Lord? Was it not my hand which made all these things? It was my hand, moreover, which fashioned the first man, Adam. Therefore, after the fashioning of the first man, which is related in Genesis, and again the righteous man Job saith, Remember that thou hast made me of clay and I shall return again to the earth. And again, hast thou not poured me out like the milk, and turned me over and over like a cheese? Thou hast clothed me with skin and flesh, thou hast knitted me together by means of bones and tendons. Thou hast granted unto me a heart of life and favor, and it is thy visitation which hath protected my spirit. These things are in thy heart, and I know, moreover, that thou art able to do everything, and that there existeth nothing which thou art not able to do. Then again the psalmist David saith, Thy hands have made and fashioned me, and again, for thou art he who took me out of my mother's womb. And again, in secret my body was not hidden from thee, for thou didst fashion it in secret. And again God saith in the book of Jeremiah, before I had fashioned thee out of the womb, I knew thee. Before thou didst come out therefrom, I sanctified thee. Now after all these things, if it was the hand of God which created all things which exist, the heavens and the earth and the sea, and everything which is therein, for what reason shall they be destroyed, and become dissolved with a mighty overthrow, both inanimate things and man, and the temple of Solomon? And again God saith in the gospel, I work, and my Father hath worked hitherto. Now the things of the six days which God made, he made in great joy and in gladness and in silence. And again, during the six thousand years which he hath made since that time, he hath supplied the world with his commandments, and with his laws, and with his holy prophets. 
and of all these the principal things are his holy desire which he hath shown towards us, and all the sufferings of his apostles, and all the supplies which have been needed by men, and by the courses of the luminaries. And again, after all these years, in a moment, suddenly everything which hath been made shall be overthrown and destroyed. And again, the things of the six days which God made when he created the world, and all these latter things shall be destroyed, and shall dissolve in the twinkling of an eye. For he, the Lord of all, and the fabricator Jesus Christ himself said in the gospel, Heaven and earth shall pass away. And again, because of that day and that hour, none knoweth except the Father. Therefore the great overthrow which shall take place shall be unbearable. Oh, how great shall be the sorrow of heart and all the sufferings at that awful time! That is to say, when the administration and management of the service of the luminaries by the angels, and the sending down of the dew upon the earth, and the blowing of the winds, and the strength of the earth which he giveth to the children of men, and the rivers and the streams, when I say all these things shall be blotted out in a single moment, and shall be destroyed. And what reason is there why a single moment should have power to do all these evil things? except it be because of sin and disobedience. It was the first transgression, that is to say, disobedience, which cast man forth from paradise. It hath changed this world, and hath made to exist the things which ought not to exist. And the things which ought indeed to exist, it hath set a restraint upon. It hath made God, who is without anger, to be wroth, and hath turned the Father from gladness to grief. Now who is he who hath committed all these sins? It is the enemy of every man. This evil beast which slayeth the soul, this bird which snatcheth greedily at its prey, this serpent which biteth, this fire which blazeth fiercely, this thief who carrieth off all souls into sin, this murderous barbarian, this troubled pool, this desert road, this evil tear, this sin which inviteth death, this similitude of greed, this stirrer up of war, this destroyer of the city, this waster of the people, who maketh the whole land to be without fruit. It is moreover he who doth make the heavens to withhold the dew, and besides he maketh parents to look upon the death of their children without mourning for their beloved. He changeth kings, he leadeth the nations into error, and he bringeth the nations to boundaries of countries which do not belong to them. The thorn and the bramble exist because of sin, and because of sin death hath become king. Moreover, because of sin a judgment took place in the paradise, and punishments were inflicted in the place of gladness. Moreover, because of sin there was to be weeping in the world which was to come, and sorrow of heart was to be in all created things. Because of sin there was a deluge upon the earth, and the cataracts of heaven poured down from heaven the waters of wrath upon the earth, and the fountains of the great deep were opened, and they belched forth the waters of vengeance. Because of sin, God mediated the blotting out of every created thing which was on the face of the whole earth. The transgression of the watchers, that is to say giants, was like unto a flood, and it was sin and impurity, and the concealment of uncleanness of every kind, which burnt up Sodom and Gomorrah. The superfluous meddling of the men of Calne was what made diverse the languages of men, and at length they became scattered abroad over the whole earth. It was sin and cruel obstinacy which filled Pharaoh and destroyed the multitudes of Egypt. It was lawlessness and idolatry which destroyed the seven nations in the land of Canaan. It was sin and disobedience to God which consumed six hundred thousand Israelites in the desert, by sword and fire, and by serpents, because they chose sin for themselves, and forsook the Lord their God. Because of all these, God cried out in the book of Isaiah, saying, For behold, in my anger I will make the sea to become a desert, and I will turn the rivers into dry land, and the fishes thereof shall be dried up, and shall be without water, and shall die because of thirst. I will spread darkness over the heavens as a garment, and I will make the apparel thereof like unto sackcloth. 
Now it was sin which did all these things, and because thereof the evil of this single hour shall overthrow and shall destroy at this awful time all the things which have been set in order since the beginning of the creation of the world. Now let us again hearken concerning the building of the temple which Solomon built in such great silence, and concerning him who is able to destroy it to its foundation. For it is written thus in the third book of the kingdom, concerning the temple which Solomon builded in the name of the Lord. Behold, O God of Israel, there hath been heard the sound neither of hammer nor axe, nor the sound of any tool of iron whatsoever. Even though in his wisdom, which was great, he permitted a few men to work in a certain place, which was at some distance from the temple. Now this he did in order that the sound of the workers in gold might not shut out from the ears of the king and prevent him from hearing the pleadings of those who came unto him to receive judgment. Now therefore God gave unto him peace, and there was no war made upon him whilst he was building, and no hostile attack was made upon him either, on this side or on that. And because of this peace he was not burdened with any serious anxiety concerning the care of the kingdom. He used to rise very early each morning, and go into the place which he had prepared, and sit down, and all the works continued in progress in due order, and there was no idleness or lax labor. For these reasons he did not permit a handy craftsman to work in the place which he had established, that the place might not be disturbed continually, and that he might not be prevented from hearing the noises of those who were pleading before the king. Now according to what is reported, he finished building the house after twenty years, and then he dedicated the house to God. And he went into the temple, and all Israel was with him. He bowed his knees before the altar of the Lord, and his hands were stretched out towards the heavens. And he prayed thus, saying, O Lord God of Israel, if the heaven and the heaven of heavens suffice thee not, then verily God will not come and abide with men. And now, O God, hearken thou unto the prayer which thy servant maketh unto thee, in order that thine eyes and thine ears may be opened towards this house. And in short, after hearing these words, God spake unto him over the altar, saying, I have heard thy prayer which thou hast made to me. I do not dwell in a house which hath been fashioned by the hands of men, yet because of thy labors which thou hast performed, and if thou shalt keep my commandments and my judgments, which I have given into thy hands, mine eyes and my ears shall be open over this house which thou hast built. If, however, thou transgress my commandments, I will cast away this great place from me, and it shall be destroyed, and become as a wilderness, that all those who pass by it shall marvel, and shall smite together their hands, and shall whistle, and shall say, Why have these things happened to this great place? And it shall be told them, Because they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, and made themselves servants of strange gods. Observe now, moreover, that after Solomon had gone to his rest, the people committed sin, and they cleaved to this evil friend, who is sin, who also made the first man to commit sin in the paradise, and who hath changed the world from the beginning. It was he also who destroyed the temple of the Hebrews by the hands of the Chaldeans, which Nabas interpreted those who are scattered, or those who are corrupt. As concerning the statements that Solomon spent twenty years in building it with costly stones, and that the materials which he made ready for the work were very great in quantity, these words refer to the work of the eighty thousand men who bear burdens, and the thirty thousand men who cut down trees in Lebanon, and the thirty-six hundred scribes, i.e. overseers, and eighty thousand hewers of stone in the mountains. And after all these labors, to think that this enemy, that is to say sin, should cause it to be destroyed in a few days. Further, might we not say that the Chaldeans worked against Jerusalem throughout a whole year? Therefore in this one year was scattered and wasted the labors of the preceding twenty years, and this because of sin. That which the Hebrews built the Chaldeans destroyed because of the lawlessness of the people. That which had been builded in silence was destroyed amid great confusion and noise. That which Solomon built in wisdom, Zedekiah destroyed in his lawlessness. Rightly, therefore, did God put the following proverb in the mouth of Solomon, 
and make him say, The wise among women build up houses, but the worker of folly destroyeth it with her hands. And the blessed man Paul also saith, Knowledge puffeth up, but love buildeth up. All these things came into being through Solomon, but the overthrow and the destruction thereof took place through Zedekiah. The sound of the tools of the workmen was not heard during the building of the temple by Solomon, the wise man, but the sound of the axes and the hammers shook Jerusalem when the Chaldeans destroyed it through the folly of Zedekiah. Now after these things hearken unto the words which the holy man Stephen spake, saying, Solomon built a temple, but the Most High dwelleth not in that which is made by the hands. Then where shall God dwell? He saith in very deed, God shall dwell with men. And this indeed took place, for our Lord Jesus Christ came forth from the heavens, and took up his abode with us. And he put on a human body like unto ours, but without sin. This is the holy and honorable temple, which our Savior took upon himself of his own free will. Moreover, David spake of him when he said, Thy temple is holy, and is a miracle in righteousness. Truly and very surely, the holy virgin Mary is the miracle, for no human being hath been created on earth like unto her. Mary is the temple which is more exalted and more honorable than the temple of Solomon. For it is she who hath become the temple of the true God, Jesus Christ, Jesus our Lord, through whom is the glory, and with him the Father and the Holy Spirit, for all ages of ages. Amen. End of homily 8. Homily 9 of Coptic Homilies in the Dialect of Upper Egypt by E. A. Wallace Budge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Discourse Which the Holy Patriarch, Apa Athanasius, Archbishop of Rakute, pronounced concerning the soul and the body. Now the word which hath been sent from heaven hath no ill will therein, and it is ready to cleanse that which is in the soul, provided that ye yourselves be prepared for the strength of the word, which whoever hath hath also need of him that listeneth. For it is like the rain from heaven, which doth not produce fruit without the earth, neither does the earth make things grow without rain from heaven, the meaning of which is that the disciple gaineth no advantage without a master to teach him, neither doth the master without a pupil to listen to him. The Logos giveth the speech. Let obedience of those who hearken to it make it perfect. For behold, the Logos giveth its strength, provided that ye yourselves are without ill will, and that ye first of all purify yourselves from every restraining influence, and from ill will, and from unbelief, which are the enemies of righteousness. Now envy warreth against love, and unbelief against belief, even as bitterness warreth against sweetness, and darkness against light, and that which is evil against that which is good. And death warreth against life, and falsehood against truth. Now those who are full of the strength of that which is adverse to good, and have in them envy and ill will and unbelief, hate love and faith. And those who hate these things are the enemies of God. For we know, O oh my beloved, that all those who are filled with envy and ill will and unbelief are the enemies of righteousness. Take good heed to yourselves, therefore, that ye may not become the enemies of righteousness. Take unto yourselves belief and love, for through these salvation hath come unto all the saints, from the beginning even until this present. Moreover, make ye manifest the power of love, not only in word, but also in deed. Now God hath given salvation for all of us, for we ourselves did not come into being as the whole world came into being, by the word of his mouth only, but he made us both by word and by deed. God was not content with making himself to say, Let us make man according to our likeness and image, but he made the action follow the word. For God took a piece of earth from the earth and fashioned man according to his own image and likeness, and he breathed into his face the breath of life. Now when Adam was nigh unto death, because of his transgression, the material body of Adam 
needed to be fashioned a second time by the hand of God, the fabricator, in order that he might receive salvation. Now the body of man rotteth away, and is buried in the earth. But the soul which God breathed into him when he became a living soul separateth itself from him. And further, when the body is dead, they carry off the soul into a place of darkness, into the region which is called Amente. For the soul and the body become separated, and death divideth them from each other. Now the soul is fettered in Amente, but the body dissolveth in the earth, and there is a very great gulf fixed between them, the flesh and the soul. Now the flesh disappeareth, and is diffused abroad in the earth, wherein it hath been buried. But the soul is powerless in the bonds of Amente. The soul, which is a strong thing, is fettered in the darkness, but the body, which is a weak thing, dissolveth in the earth. Now the body is not strong enough to move, and it dissolveth in the funerary mountain, Neither is the soul able to do anything, for it is fettered in a mente. For when death beareth away a man, the strong portion of him which is the soul, it fettereth in a mante, and the weak portion of him which is the flesh is carried off into the earth. Now it is like a general who captureth the city of a king. When he hath taken possession thereof, he first of all seetheth the king, and shutteth him up under restraint. And this is what death doeth first of all to the soul. Now the body is like unto a ship, which hath no steer men upon it. That is to say, the body perisheth, and it falleth to pieces, limb from limb, because the soul has ceased to steer it, and the members thereof are dissipated in the funerary mountain, and they perish like the city which hath been laid waste, and like the ship which hath no steer men in it, and hath become submerged in the waters. For it is the soul itself which steereth its body, even as the king administereth his city. Now when the man is dead, his soul is not able to steer his flesh, because it is fettered in a monte, and it drifteth about among the waves of unrighteousness, even as a steersman whose ship drifteth about on the sea, and the soul heeleth over into the waves which are ready for it, and it is driven on into the breakers of the thieves that engulf it that is to say, adultery and fornication, and the love of ornament, and the worship of idols, and the slaying of men, and hatred. Now these are the things whereby man slayeth the soul. And because of these things, whereby the evil one has seduced the soul, it is given over to the evil one, to whom it hath clung closely, and it is carried away into Amante, for he carrieth it off like a thief. Moreover, he maketh it to be without the power to assist its own body, which perisheth. The flesh dissolveth in the earth, the substance thereof decayeth, and one member droppeth away from the other, because the soul is not in the body to bind them together. And the soul itself is bound in a mente, having fetters not on the feet only, but on its whole person. For this reason it hath not the power to give help to its own body, and to prevent it from decaying in the earth. Now it is like a captain who dieth when his ship floundereth. That is to say, if the soul were not bound in a mente, it would be able to steer its own body, and would not allow it to perish. Moreover, the soul is bound in a mente, not only with fetters, but it is bound with its own sins as with cords. And for this reason it hath become powerless, and it forsaketh its body, leaving it to perish in the earth. And besides, the soul is made to suffer torments in a mente. It becometh the footstool of death. And when it is in a mente, it is wont to weep and sigh after its good body, saying, Where is my body, that body wherein I used to sing hymns? Where is my body, that body wherein I used to pray to God? Where is my good body, that body wherein I was a man? I used to walk about with my friends and my kinsfolk, and I made merry in my body. I was called by my name whilst I was in my human body, but now I am no longer a man, but a soul. Now when death has separated the soul from the body, they call the body a corpse, and it giveth forth fetidness. I inquire after my body, but I do not inquire after my name. That body together with which I was a man and in which I spake. And when the soul ceaseth to be in its body, 
the body can never again speak with a pleasing voice, but with a choked and exceeding sad voice, and it is like unto a musical instrument with hath no sound in it, and is speechless. That is to say, the soul is not in the body to give utterance therefrom, and the body perisheth in the earth like a broken pot, and it becometh speechless, and it hath neither sound nor voice, and it is motionless, for it is a corpse. For the soul which adorned it hath departed, taking with it the power of speech. And it is impossible, moreover, to know what any man who is dead was like, for his form is destroyed by the sand, and thou canst know neither what his face was like, nor the form of his person, nor the height of his stature, nor canst thou tell what the sound of his voice was like. For the son cannot know his father or his mother, or his brother or his friend. It is wholly impossible for him to recognize the face of any one of them in the tomb. The lips have rotted away, the nose hath decayed, the eyes are blocked up, the color of the face has changed, and it is impossible to recognize any one of them, because all bodies turn into dust in the tomb, and they perish, and nothing of them remaineth to us. Now it is impossible to identify a bone, and make it to rejoin the body to which it belonged, because the bone hath become bare, and there is no flesh on it. And besides this, even before the flesh which clothed the bone crumbled away, it would have been impossible for thee to show clearly to whom it belonged. For who can identify a bone when it hath been taken out of the member to which it belonged? Or who is there that can make known to us the color of the hair of one who is dead? And it is wholly impossible for thee to recognize the bones of Adam, or to say what manner of men the prophets were, and what kind of bodies had the patriarchs and the apostles. They have all been cast in the earth, and their heads and their bodies have become separated. If the son were to seek after his father in the tomb, he would not recognize him. Neither would a friend recognize his friend, nor a brother recognize his brother. Nor could a man address any one of them by name, being sure that he really was the person who bore that name, or identify his form, because they have all turned to dust in the tomb, and there is no longer any human resemblance in them. For man is scattered abroad over the face of all the earth, and he is poured out in every place, for the earth beareth a grievous burden of tombs and sepulchres, and every place is filled with the blood of those who are dead. Moreover, the earth has become one great sepulchre for those who are dead. It was one man only, i.e. Adam, who was taken from the earth, but those who are buried in it are thousands of thousands, and ten thousands of ten thousands. Every place is filled with the dead, the sea and the rivers, the earth and the mountains, and the wild beasts and the birds of prey devour the dead, and are sated with their slaughtered bodies. Edimente is filled with the souls which are bound in fetters. O thou form of earth wherein grief is abundant! O thou form of man which groweth only for destruction, and flourisheth only in sorrows and sighs! The joys of those who are upon the earth is only for a moment, and yet they are wont to think that it is great, but it slippeth away speedily through their hands. Behold, one man rejoiceth, and taketh a woman to wife, and soon after he weepeth for her, for she is dead. Behold, one man rejoiceth in his son, and behold, soon after he weepeth over his grave. Behold, another man exalteth because of his father, and soon afterwards he maketh lamentation and burieth him. For there is no profit whatsoever for man. He is one who is intended to lament, and there is no consolation in him. He hath not the power to pacify him that shall destroy him, neither doth he receive him that could console him. Each man in his own way must die for himself, and no friend can make an appeal for his friend, but each man must suffer the death to which he is liable. There is no prophet of God who can give men consolation, for they will not hearken unto him, neither will they really believe in the God of heaven, nor will they do his will until they fall into death. Moreover, God is wroth with man because of his unutterable and indescribable transgressions which destroy him.
For man suffereth evil in every way because of his transgressions, namely by sickness, by punishment, by sorrow, by the grief and suffering which envelop him, by cold and heat, by burning, by wild beasts, and birds of prey, and reptiles, by the times in which he lived, and by old age. The winds, and the earthquakes, and the rains, and the dews, do harm to man. The rivers drown him, the wild beasts devour him, and he is destroyed by death. All these things have held him in contempt, since he was disobedient to God. And having been driven forth from the paradise, he came out into this world which is full of sufferings. In it are envy and adultery and fornication and adultery. And these are the things through which man dieth. All these things have become fellow workers with death in respect of man. And they war against him with wickedness, in order that death may bring him to the dust. For man hath at no time any enjoyment, never hath he any pleasure, for when during his lifetime doth man rejoice? Doth he rejoice when he is in the womb of his mother? What kind of enjoyment can he have when he is carried about in the darkness and foetor thereof? And when he is in pain and restraint on every side in the blood of the belly? But he must come forth from his mother's body. Doth he rejoice in doing this? Nay, for he runneth an exceeding great risk of dying. But surely he rejoiceth when he is at his mother's breast. Now in what manner did he take the nipple? He crieth loudly and weepeth. Now the child that is healthier neither crieth out nor weepeth. But surely when man is a little child, he crawleth about on the ground and rejoiceth. In what way then doth he rejoice? He is liable to be attacked by some beast, which will trample him to death, and will split open his head, and the foam of his mouth and the intestines will be scattered about on the herbage and on the ground. But surely if he groweth up into a young man, he will rejoice. In what way then will he rejoice? I say he cannot rejoice, for the disposition of youth surroundeth him on every side, with the lusts that are full of danger. And if he doth not crush them, they cause him to die in an evil manner. But surely when he hath taken a wife and hath begotten children, he will rejoice. In what way then will he rejoice? He will live in a state of anxiety about the children who will commit acts of folly. But surely when he shall have become an old man, he will rejoice and take rest. In what way then will he have rest? He will rest with the dangers of old age always around him. And at the end of all these troubles is the expectation of death which consumeth the soul like a fire. O thou death, that carriest off people in every age and condition, the children and the old man, the youth and the man of mature growth. For age is no obstacle to death, and he carrieth away people of every age and condition. Now it is an exceedingly sorrowful thing to look upon death in man, and to contemplate his decay. The face hath become ghastly pallid in the garb of death, and the body hath become shriveled up, and the mouth is shut up, and the hair hath become lustrous, and the eyes have become sightless and are shut, and the limbs are motionless. And as for the other changes which take place in the body, when it is placed in the earth, the flesh crumbleth away, and the sinews and ligaments decay, and the other members which have been laid bare, and those which have not been laid bare become dissolved, and the humors which have dried up, and the dust which is abundant. For man is a thing of naught, and he is like unto a flower of the grasses, which withereth, and he shriveleth up like a log of wood, which is burned in the fire and is consumed. Now after the destruction of man, and seeing his wretchedness, which was very great, God visited that which he himself had fashioned, and he made in his own form and likeness, in order that death might not become the conqueror. Death boasted himself, saying, I will conquer man. Now the devil fighteth against man at all times, and he carrieth him away captive through the evil of death into the gate of Amante, and he hurleth his wickedness against man at all times, until at length he bringeth him under the power of death, and he shutteth him up in the prison of Amante. For this reason the soul, which is fast bound in darkness, 
is not able to make its escape from the place of imprisonment of those who are dead. For this reason the Father sent his Son upon the earth. Now he had no body of flesh. Therefore the Holy Spirit caused him to take upon himself flesh in the womb of the Virgin. And God became man, so that he might deliver him that had gone astray, and might gather together those who were scattered through the envy of the devil, and might bring them into his fold. Death having made a separation in man, those whom death had scattered, these did Christ gather together. And he hath made man one again, the soul with the body. For death bound the soul in a mente, and he made the flesh to dissolve in the earth. Thus he divided man into two parts. The Savior Jesus, however, himself set free the soul from its bonds, and he bound the flesh together inseparably, and he brought the two towards each other, and made them one of one, the soul and the body, and he rejoined them each to the other. He gave the body to the soul, and the soul he placed in the body. He made the body to be an instrument of speech, and he gave it constituted members. And now, O soul, sing thou hymns of praise in the body wherein thou art. To thine own imperishable God, because Christ died for us, in order that we might live with him forever. For he was neither liable to death, nor was he under any obligation to die by death. Neither was it absolutely necessary for him to make himself to become man, nor had he himself any need to take upon himself the flesh of man. For he is God, and he is arrayed in all the glory of divinity. For this reason he endured patiently, and was made after the manner of men who die, though he is the God who alone dieth not. Now for what reason did he come down upon the earth, seeing that he himself was the king, who was reigning over the heavens, who compelled him to go to the cross, and to die gladly. Though he himself was the fabricator of the universe, he endured patiently and allowed himself to be begotten in the womb of a woman. And they wrapped in swaddling bands him that had been arrayed in all the glory of the Father. He who sat on the chariots of the cherubim was laid in a manger, and he sucked the nipple at the breast of a woman. He before whom the seraphim stand in awe, ascribing glory to his divinity, he who sent forth waters to flow in the rivers, and the rains and the dews, and who sent forth waters from heaven, received baptism in the Jordan by a mortal man. He from whom the whole universe receiveth light was treated with contempt by the Jews, he upon whose word hang the seven heavens, and the firmament, and the earth, and Amante, was himself hung upon a cross of wood. He who took a clod of dead earth and fashioned it into a living man, bare patiently the scorn of those who mocked him, in order that by the contempt of himself he might save man, who had gone to perdition through his own sins. He gave his soul of salvation for the soul of man. He gave his holy flesh on behalf of the whole race of Adam. And he gave his blood on behalf of all. He gave man for man, and his death for our death. And the death which men are under an obligation to suffer, and which they fear, become a blessing, because Christ died for us. This is the love which Christ made manifest. He died for us who are sinners, in order that he might save us. For what righteous man ever died on behalf of a sinner? Or what father ever died on behalf of his own son, whom he had begotten? Again, what friend ever died on behalf of his friend? Or what loving brother ever died on behalf of his brother? No man ever did such a thing. That is to say, no man ever let himself die for another by his own wish, or through his own good pleasure only. But Christ came of himself and of his own free will and love. And as to us sinners, not only did he fashion us in the form of Adam and make us to become men, but when we were dead in our sins, he came and bore suffering on our behalf and he hath given us life again by his love. Now at the time when he fashioned us with his hand, he had not suffered on our behalf, but now that he hath begotten us a second time, through the suffering of his death, he suffereth with us even as doth she who give us birth. He hath borne with us for an exceeding long time, and he hath not burnt up the world, 
the people whereof treated him with contempt, and scourged him by the hands of sinners, and put him to death and buried him, according to that which the prophet spake, saying, Thou hast brought me into the dust of death. Who was it that brought him there? It was the wicked people whom he loved that put him to death. He came to them to save them, and they cast him aside like a straw. Consider, moreover, O men, the return which the children of Israel made to our God. They pierced the side of him who had created them. They inflicted sufferings upon him who had on very many occasions conferred benefits upon them and their fathers. They paid him back with evil things instead of good. They showed hatred instead of true love, wherewith he had loved them. They made sorrowful him who had given joy unto them, he who raised the dead among them, and they saw him doing it, he who had healed the lame and cleansed those who were leprous, he who had given light to the blind, he it was whom they killed and hung upon a tree. Consider, moreover, O men, the insolent daring of the Jews. They hung upon a tree him that had hung out the earth. They drove nails into him that had established the earth on the waters. They broke the limbs of him that had heaped up the heavens in his wisdom. They bound as a prisoner him that had released them from the servitude of Pharaoh. They put fetters on him that set sinners free. To him that had given them a stream of water to quench their thirst, did they give vinegar to drink when he thirsted. And they sustained him with gall when he was in the agony of death on the cross. And they did not remember that he it was who had given them water as sweet as honey to drink from the rock. They bound the hands and feet of him that had unbound the limbs of those who were paralyzed. They themselves were bound in the hand of the devil, because they performed his will. For he kept them bound until the coming of him that should release those who were in captivity, and set free those who were bound, of him that had sent forth the sun and the moon to give light to them, and had opened the eyes of those who were blind from their birth. Did they close the eyes like those of a dead man? Him who had raised the dead, did they bury in the earth? Oh, what a new and incomprehensible mystery! He who was the judge was judged. He who had done away their sins was bound with cords. Nails were driven into the hands of him who had fashioned men. They hung on a tree him who had placed breath in their throats. They broke him who could break their members from their bodies. On the cross they compelled him who had filled the earth with life to drink gall. He through whom the whole universe liveth died. Now they did scoff at him greatly whilst he was on the cross. And before he died they gave utterance to many mocking words, and they gibbed at him. When our Lord was hanging upon the wood of the cross, the sepulchres opened, and Amente was rent asunder. He delivered the souls therefrom, and he raised up the dead, and very many of the saints showed themselves in Jerusalem. Now these things happened before the mystery was fulfilled on the cross, and when Christ died he abolished the enemy, he bound in fetters the mighty tyrant, he set his cross before him, he conquered in their presence, and he gained the victory. Our Lord Jesus Christ lifted up his body on the cross, and when death had seen life, he fell down at his feet. Then the powers of the heavens marveled at his wisdom. The angels were stupefied with admiration of him. The elements were terror-stricken, and all created things were shaken when they saw this new mystery and this awful sight. They saw God hanging on a tree, and men were lifted up near him on the tree, his feet were fastened to it by means of nails, and likewise his hands, which were extended, were fastened by nails to the tree. And the Jews mocked at him and laughed at him and derided him, because they did not understand the mystery. The earth trembled when it saw the shamelessness of the Jews. The mountains thereof trembled, and the hills shook and quaked. The sea made its waves to rise up to a height sufficient to cover the world. The abyss was disturbed, 
and opened its mouth to swallow up all created things. The whole of creation was moved with wrath because of the abominable insolence of the Jews. The luminaries of heaven became dark. The sun withdrew to rest. The moon was perturbed and hid itself, and the stars ceased to shine on the wicked men. Though the moon was full, it did not shine, and moreover, the sun having withdrawn to rest, the whole world was in darkness. They saw their God, who had created them, hanging upon a tree like a thief. The day turned into night, and an angel who was wroth came forth from among all the angels, with his drawn sword in his hands, to slay them quickly altogether, and he was prevented from doing this by the mercy of Christ. And the angel laid his hand upon the curtain of the temple, and rent it in twain from the top to the bottom. And all the angels were looking forth from the heavens, and they were wroth because of the loving kindness of God the Father, prevented them all from destroying the Jews. The light of the day took to flight, the world was shrouded in darkness, the darkness of the blackest night. All these things happened before Christ closed his eyes. And his light made haste to arise in Amente. And Amente was perturbed when the Lord went down into it, not in the flesh, but in the spirit. For he had power over all creation, and he could destroy it before his last hour. He poured out his blood on the earth, and it protected the earth and those who were therein. His body continued to hang upon the tree for the sake of the elements, and his spirit went down to Amente and saved those who were in that region. He despoiled Amente and made himself master of all of it. His body raised up those who were dead on the earth, and his spirit set free the souls which were in Amante. For in that hour in which our Lord was hanging upon the cross, in that very same hour, the sepulchres opened, and the gatekeepers of Amante saw him, and they shook with fear and took to flight. He burst open the gates of brass, he broke through the bolts of iron, and he took the souls which were in Amante and carried them to his father. When the Lord had broken up Amante and had gained the victory over death, he set the enemy under restraint. Now the souls he brought out of Amante, but the bodies he raised up on the earth, Furthermore, consider the mighty and marvelous strength which was in his mortal body as he hung upon the tree. For neither was creation able to endure his dead body, nor could the elements endure it. And Amante could not endure his spirit. Every place was filled with trouble because of the sufferings of our Savior, and all created things were troubled because of his death. For they were not accustomed to see their Lord treated with scorn and contempt. All created things were stupefied and said, What is this new mystery? The judges pass sentence upon him, and he speaketh not. Those who know him not look upon him, and are not ashamed. Those who have no authority over him take possession of him, and he resisteth them not. Those who are not his equals treat him with scorn, and he becometh not angry. He who is impassable endureth sufferings, and is not wroth. He who is immortality hath died, and he hath endured pain patiently. He who dwelleth in the heavens hath been buried in the earth, and hath kept silence. What is this mystery, saith all creation? For everything marveled at his loving kindness. And having risen from the dead at dawn on the first day of the week, and having vanquished death, he bound in fetters the tyrant, and set men free. Then did every created thing know that the judge had had judgment passed on him for the sake of the salvation of man, and that for man's sake he who was invisible had been seen, and he who was infinite had been measured, and he who was impassable had endured sufferings, and he who was immortal had died, and he who was in the heavens had been buried. For he who had become man was judged in order that he might show mercy to us. He was put to death in order that he might set free those who were in bonds. He endured sufferings in order that he might give us rest. He died that he might make us to live. He was buried in order that he might raise us from the dead. If the Lord had not endured sufferings with the race of man, by what manner of means would mankind have been saved? Moreover, death fell down at the feet of Christ, and Christ carried him away, 
and the devil, who had been a rebel, became a captive. Christ made a monte to quake, and the power of the devil he turned backwards. Death heard the voice of the Lord, as he cried unto all the souls, Come forth, O ye who are bound in fetters, O ye who sit in the darkness and the shadow of death. On you hath the light arisen. I preach unto you, for I am Christ, the Son of God. Then he set free the souls of the saints, and he raised them up with him. And earth itself cried out, saying, Spare me, O Lord, free thou me from the curse which is on me. Remove from me the wickedness of the devil. Thou hast held me to be worthy of having thy body buried in me, in the place of blood, which was poured out upon me, in order that thou mightest raise men from the dead. Thy glorious image is spread abroad in every place. Except thyself, when thou utterest thy words, no one shall resist thy commands. But it was thy love which compelled thee to come to the beings whom thou hadst fashioned. For behold, thou didst stand on the earth, and didst seek after the members of the beings whom thou hast made. Take thou then man the deposit, take thou thine image, which thou hast committed as a pledge to me. Take thou Adam, being complete in his likeness. Then Christ arose from the dead in the third hour of the day, and he took the saints with him to his Father. Now all mankind shall receive salvation through the death of Christ. For one was judged instead of all men, and salvation and mercy came into the whole world. Moreover, one died in order that all might rise from the dead, and the Lord died on behalf of every one, in order that every one should rise from the dead with him. For having died, he put man on himself like a garment, and took him with himself into the heaven, which is in the heavens, and man became one of one with him. He took him as a gift to his father. The gift was not gold, neither was it silver, but it was man whom he had created in his own likeness, and in his own image. Moreover, this Christ did God the Father exalt. He seated him on his right hand, on the exalted throne, and he appointed him to be the judge of those who are living, and of those who are dead, and captain of all his creation. He sitteth above the cherubim, he who hath created the Jerusalem of heaven, that is to say, the true bridegroom, and the king of all ages. Glory be unto him for all ages of ages. Amen. End of homily 9homily 10 of coptic homilies in the dialect of upper egypt by e a wallace budge the sea recording is in the public domain the discourse which apo eusebius bishop of caesarea of cappadocia pronounced concerning the canaanitish woman great is the storm but it hath not been able to hinder the readiness of those who have come great is the trial but it hath not destroyed our sufferings the church shall never be free from those who contend against her, but she shall never be overcome. Certain folk plot craftily against her, but she vanquisheth them. Howsoever great may be the evil which they meditate against her, she increaseth exceedingly. The waves break over her and have no effect upon her, for she hath taken her stand on this rock, which is the immovable word of God, and she is herself immovable. The rock it was who said, The gates of Amente shall not prevail against her. He who fighteth against her destroyeth only himself, but the church herself becometh stronger and stronger. Job was a good man before his trial, but the days wherein he was healthy in his body were not like unto the days in which his infirmity wove a crown and set it upon his head. Be not afraid at any time of temptation, if thy soul be prepared. For the matter is like unto the gold to which the furnace doth no injury. That is to say, tribulation doth no harm to him that beareth himself with fortitude. What doth the furnace do to the gold, except to purify it more and more? That is to say, he who riseth up before tribulation when the suffering which hath to be endured cometh to him, is exalted thereby. Cowardly inaction weakeneth the soul, but trial giveth victory to the layman. 
no moreover that those who endure no trial receive shame and that those who endure trial receive election where are the things which are reckoned unto them nothing maketh itself visible i come out into the market and i look upon the wares therein i see that they are weak plants on which the wind blew and they were thrown to the ground in straw which had been threshed out nevertheless the flower hath remained pure who is there that can fight against them successfully their conscience it is which giveth them victory over those who fight against them let us prepare a table yesterday paul provided his table for us today the table is that of matthew yesterday it was the tent maker today it is the tax gatherer yesterday it was the blasphemer today it is the man of obedience yesterday it was the pursuer today it is the man of avarice the blasphemer however did not continue to be a blasphemer but became an apostle and he who was a robber did not continue to be a man of greed but became an evangelist i will not make mention of the wickedness of their earlier years which afterwards became spiritual excellences our masters did not give light whilst they lived in their former state of sin but they did shine brightly at the last when living in a state of righteousness now the tax gatherers and blasphemers are the masters of the earth what kind of place then is that of the tax gatherer it is a place wherein men plunder at midday the injustice which is according to the law maketh itself manifest as well as the injustice which is done in the presence of the law the tax gatherer is the advocate of thieves when a thief is caught in the very act of stealing he is ashamed but the tax gatherer is bold of speech and action even while he plundereth but suddenly the tax gatherer became an evangelist how did this come about when jesus was passing by he saw him sitting in his tax gatherer's shed and he said unto him rise up follow me O oh, the might of the word the hook came and it hooked the captive and it armed him like a soldier the hook came and it made the clay become gold matthew was in the pit of wickedness and it drew him up into the mesh of the net of spiritual excellence let no man fall into despair concerning his salvation for evil deeds possess not a constitution which endureth for ever and moreover we were created in a state of liberty if thou art a tax gatherer thou hast the power to turn thyself into an evangelist if thou art a thief thou hast the power to enter into paradise and if thou art a magician thou hast the power to worship thy god for there is no kind of sin whatsoever which repentance will not do away therefore god hath chosen the greatest sinners on the earth so that no man might fall into despair about himself thou shalt not say i have committed sin which is what usually happeneth for thou hast a physician by thee who is wont to treat thee with such medicines as thou wishest was it not he who made thee and when thou didst not exist did not he make thee to be thee he hath not made thee anew as he made thee at the beginning when he took a piece of earth and fashioned it into a man but he hath made the earth and clay to become flesh similar to that which hath ligaments and bones and hair and eyelids and eyes and the shoulders and the breast and the hands and the feet and all the other members are not all these members earthy in substance then entered skill and handicraft and she made all created things according to their kinds inquire not concerning the manner in which they were made and waste not thy labor in prying into what is but believe that the matter was super miraculous thou wouldst never have been able to describe the means by which creation was made if fire cometh upon thorns it consumeth them how much more then shall the word of god make sins to become white and consume them and if thou art in the habit of saying i have sinned exceedingly but who is there that is without sin now i am using the very words which thou thyself wilt say confess thy sins first of all 
and then do thou the work of making thyself just. If thou hast committed sin, make haste, stand up on thy feet, be sorry, and let thy heart eat thee in remorse, and pour out thy tears. For did not the sinful woman act in this wise? And did she not pour out her tears, and lay hold on repentance? Now Jesus came out of the border of Tyre and Sidon, and behold a woman set out to go to him. The evangelist is stricken with wonder, and saith, A woman, that is to say, the strongest weapon of the devil, the mother of sin, the beginning of wickedness, woman who was cast forth from paradise. This is woman, and such is her nature. Oh, what strange and wonderful works are these! The Jews fled from him, but the woman fled to him, and made supplication unto him, saying, O son of David, have mercy upon me. Consider this woman who made herself to be a preacher, and one who acknowledged the government of God. For she said, Lord, which was the confession of his divinity, and the son of David, which was the acknowledgment of his manhood. Have mercy upon me. Is not this act better than every other act in this world? Consider how this truly wise soul said, Have mercy upon me. Is not this citizenship better than every other citizenship in the world? She said, I was in danger. I fled to his feet for mercy. Wilt thou then search out my sins? Give me salvation abundantly, inasmuch as the place of mercy searcheth not out sins. O thou woman, what didst thou think within thyself? Thou wast a lawbreaker and a harlot. How couldst thou possibly dare to go out to meet him? Consider, moreover, the wisdom of this woman. She did not make an appeal to the apostles, saying, Take me into him. She made no supplication to Peter, neither needed she any of the other apostles to help her. But she said, I want, however, to see him, but I have no need of men to make him come to where I am. And why? Because he came down and took upon him flesh. I will speak with him in the flesh. Oh, how great is the loving kindness of God towards man! He before whom the cherubim in the heavens tremble in awe permitted a sinful woman to stand and talk with him upon the earth. She said, Have mercy upon me. For this reason hast thou taken upon thyself flesh, and hast come forth, and hast entered into the world for the sake of sinners, like unto myself. Those who are in the heavens tremble in awe before him, yet those on the earth hold converse with him boldly. Have mercy upon me. What is it that thou desirest? I seek after mercy. What dost thou wish? My daughter is grievously afflicted. My sorrow is great. Heal thou my members, which are within me, for I am being consumed. Preserve my bowels, and take thou me out of this burning heat of fever. What shall I do? I shall die. Why did she not say, Have mercy upon my daughter? On the contrary, she said, Have mercy on me, for my daughter doth not perceive the torment of the disease with which she is grievously vexed, that she is seized by the disease in its most severe form, as evident because she doth not perceive what it is. Have mercy upon me, because I see this sight every day, and great is my grief. What do I call her? I call her a dead body. For though she moveth and liveth, yet she knoweth not what she doeth. For I know not the name of the disease, neither do I know of what kind it is, or whether my daughter shall die through it. Now death appertaineth to every one. In what condition shall I see her on my return? With her eyes starting from their sockets in terror, and her hands with the bones thereof protruding, and the hair torn out in frenzy, and the mouth dripping with foam, and meanwhile the devil which is contending with her is hidden inside her, and doth not appear. Have mercy upon me. My water flood or tempest is great. This is the kind of disease from which I suffer, and also from demonical wickedness. Have mercy upon me. Consider the wisdom of this woman. Why did she not go to the magicians, or to those who used exorcisms, or to the women who dealt with the bodies of the dead, or to the soothsayers who were in the habit of paying honor to devils, 
or to those who could make the sufferings of sick folk to become greater or to diminish. Nay, she forsook the court of the devil, and she came to the feet of the Savior of souls, and said, Have mercy on me, for my daughter is grievously vexed. Dost thou observe the fortitude and the patient endurance? And as the woman raised herself from the ground, he answered her not a word. O oh, these things which were done publicly, she made supplication to him, and she besought him earnestly, and she entreated him, but he answered her not a word. The sickness increased, but the physician kept silence. The blow was sharp and severe, and the word kept silence. The physician held his hand. What is this new and wonderful matter? Thou didst run after others, and didst say, Come ye unto me, I will heal you. Yet from her who ran after thee, thou didst run away. Have mercy on me. I was not sent unto any except the sheep which had gone astray of the house of Israel. And his disciples went to him, and entreated him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth out after us. And the woman said, Thou thyself seest that my outcry is great, but my cry which is in my heart also is to thee. And again they said unto him, As the Lord and as the lover of mankind, give salvation to this woman. What shall I give? I am not sent unto any except the sheep which have gone astray in the house of Israel. This is in itself the whole matter, for it was this very thing that thou didst take upon thyself flesh, that thou mightest do good to a certain woman who was going to perish. Wouldest thou then leave the world to become a desert, and destroy the Scythians and the Arabs, and the Elamites, and the people of Cilicia and Cappadocia, and the Syrians and the Phoenicians, and the people of every place on which the sun looketh? Or didst thou come into this world only for the sake of the Jews? Wilt thou allow the lands of the Gentiles to become a desert? Or hast thou forgotten that they scoff at thy father and worship idols? Wherefore then did David speak according to the flesh, and say, Ask of me, and I will give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and thy dominion unto the end of the earth? And in like manner also Isaiah, who saw the seraphim, said, The root of Jesse shall flourish, and he who shall arise shall rule the nations, and in him shall the nations hope. And again, a ruler shall not cease from Judah, nor a governor from his heritage, until there come he that hath been constituted ruler, and he it is whom the nations await. And again, O all ye nations, clap ye your hands. And yet thou doest thus, Thou, O lover of every soul, who didst say to thy disciples, Go ye, baptize all nations, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. This Canaanitish woman, however, received a profitable rebuke. She came out of a place of madness and stupefying folly, a place where they worship idols. This miserable woman came and made entreaty by reason of the matter which had come upon her daughter. And thou didst say unto her, I have not been sent to any except the sheep which have gone astray in the house of Israel. Yet in that very hour, wherein the centurion came to thee, thou didst say, I am coming, I will heal him. And again, in the hour of the thief, thou didst say unto him, This day thou shalt be with me in paradise. And again, in the case of the man who was paralyzed, thou didst make him to take up his bed, and he walked. And again, Lazarus, didst thou call when he had been in the tomb four days, and he came forth. The dead thou didst raise to life, those whose members were withered, thou didst gird with strength. The harlots thou didst hold to be more chaste than the virgins. And what didst thou say to her, the wretched Canaanitish woman, whom thou wouldst not answer at first? He said, Is it good to take the bread of children to throw it to the dogs? All the solicitude of this physician, he understands her, and she had been rebuked. All these words were intended to shame the Jews, who called themselves children. They had, however, taken to themselves the nature of their own dogs, according to that which Paul spake, saying, Beware ye of dogs, beware ye of these workers of evil, beware ye of those of the concision. And again she said unto him, Have mercy on me. But he said, 
Is it good to take the bread of the children to throw it to the dogs? And she said within herself, Yea, Lord, thou callest me a dog, and I confess that thou treatest me like unto a dog. I do not excuse myself from derision. Give me that which thou seest fit. Thou hast called me a dog. Give me then the crumbs. For the dogs are in the habit of eating of the crumbs which fall from the table of their masters. He said unto her, Who hath until now begged for that which is cast away and rejected? Therefore, O woman, thou shalt be rewarded straightway. And the Lord spake, saying, O thou woman, may thy prayers be heard in that hour wherein I uttered thy appeal before God, and offer supplication to him. Thou sayest, I have appealed to him once, and I have prayed to him twice and thrice, and ten times and twenty times have I bowed the knee to him. Thou hast bowed the knee, and thy mouth spake, but thy heart was counting the cost, and thou wast thinking about thy friends and thy substance. Thy soul hath taken its stand at the door. Turn not thou away, until thou hast received thy request. Now certain folk are wont to go into the churches, and pour forth tens of thousands of strings of words. But God hath no need of a multitude of words, though he hath very great need of prayer. Make thou thyself to be like unto this Canaanitish woman. Pray in whatsoever place thou art. If thou art in the bath, or if thou art in the street, pray. And if they hail thee before the judge, pray. And if the judge break thee by his decision, let thy prayer go to God, on thy way to execution. He inquireth not about the place where thou prayest, but he doth inquire concerning a right mind. When Jeremiah was in the pit of mire, he found God there, and he prayed to him. Daniel was in the pit of the lions, and God helped him. The three saints who were in the furnace turned to God, and made supplication unto him. When Job was seated in the dust among the worms, he turned to God and made an appeal to him. And thou thyself also, if thou makest an appeal unto him, he will hear thee in thy prayer. Make thou thyself like unto this Canaanitish woman. And when thou goest into the church of the Persians, and of the Coathians, and of the Hindus, and of the Moors, thou shalt hear Christ calling out, O thou woman, great is thy faith. And behold, very many times thou shalt acquire blessing and honor by the remembrance of her, which shall abide and be glorious. And though thou hast not a daughter with thee, who is possessed of a devil, yet hast thou with thee thy soul which committeth sin. To him who is possessed of a devil, it is usual to show mercy. But he who committeth sin of himself, men are wont to hate. Against him that is possessed of a devil, the matter is not reckoned. For him that committeth sin of himself, there is no defense whatsoever. Now as concerning the Canaanitish woman, in what hour was the devil cast from her daughter? In that very great hour wherein Christ said unto her, O thou woman, great is thy faith. The Son of God cast out the devil, for no man would be able to go into the place where he was. But he was God, who filleth every place. Had he wished, he could have gone against the prince of devils at the same time. That which is under his feet shall not destroy thee. If it were not thus, one might say unto thee, He is inattentive, or he is asleep. Now this is not the habit with God. In the hour wherein thou shalt cry unto him, he shall hear thee, and at every hour. Let neither doorkeeper nor steward prevent thee from crying. Do thou say, Have mercy on me, like this Canaanitish woman, and he shall come unto thee immediately. Consider the following speech which maketh manifest that the Son is like unto the Father, and that he is equal with him. At the time wherein God created the heavens, he said, Let the heaven be, and the heaven was, and let the earth be, and the earth was, and let the air or sky be, and the air was, and let the sun and moon be, and they came into being. O the goodness of God which created for us the Son who is equal with the good Father in every respect. In divinity the Father spake in times of old, saying, Let things be, and they came unto him. The Son himself said, Let it be unto thee according to that which thou desirest, 
and it was so. And her daughter ceased to be vexed by the devil from that hour. What was it that enabled the Canaanitish woman to drive the devil out of her daughter, or to drive him out at all? It was done according to the command of the Savior of souls, in the mercy and loving kindness of our God, and by his grace shall we ourselves be healed. For all these things let us give thanks to God the Father, and to the Son, Jesus Christ, who hath informed us by his holy mercy, saying, I am in my Father, and my Father is in me, to whom belongeth the glory for all ages. Amen. End of homily 10. End of Coptic homilies in the dialect of Upper Egypt by E. A. Wallace Budge.